Welcome everyone to Comics from the Multiverse episode 397. I am Peter and joining me as always is Matt. Hey, what's up? It's a comics podcast, a DC comics podcast. We get to go and talk about the books we read this week. It's, it's, it's quite that simple. Coming up on this week's show, we've got Detective Comics 1082, The Flash issue 6, Green Arrow issue 9, The Penguin issue 7, Amazon's Attack issue 5, G. Garrick, The Flash issue 5, and Power Girl issue 6. So that's what's coming up. Um, I, I was going to do a Patreon book, but then I looked ahead and saw that next week I, I have even less books, so I'm just going to do both of them next week. Uh, uh, that's it, there is one more book next week than I thought there was, because that, that uh, Batman Black Label book starting next week. But Oh yeah, the... Still, um... The the Jurgens one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the the Golden Age sort of set one. Yeah. So uh, that'll be curious. But uh, yeah, that's what's coming up. A little bit of news, uh, and of course we'll start with Matt's uh, favorite segment in, in a in a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yes, that's uh, that's what's happening. All right, welcome to the show. How was your week, Matt? Um, very very busy. Uh, it was one of those weeks that felt like it took two weeks. So mm-hmm. you know. Uh, I watched, I watched Mission Impossible, uh, Dead Reckoning. Well, and, I was going to say the first one because you sort of no, paused after no, that. No, no, <laughs> I felt, I felt like I should. I couldn't remember. I can't remember the titles that well. The Past Coast Protocol. Like I forget which ones which. I just have to remember which actors are in them. Uh, so because I almost called this one Fallout, but Fallout was the last one, right? And then uh, what was the fifth one? Rogue Nation, I think. Rogue Nation. There we go. But yeah, I know. I watched Dead Reckoning Part 1, and I'm mad that I have to wait a whole year for Part 2. Like, a year plus. Well, it was funny, because the second one was scheduled for this year, mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. but they hadn't even like shot it yet, and the strike was still going on. So yeah. it was like, you're going to delay this. You know you're going to delay yeah. this. And they eventually did, but there was a, yeah. a good bit of time where they yeah. still had it scheduled for July 2024, and I'm like, ain't no way you're making that date. Yeah, yeah. Um... It's just, it's also very funny that I I thought that Fallout came out during the pandemic. In my head, we watched it when we were at Stay at Home. I looked up and it, and it had been five years, mm. almost. And it did not feel like that. And then my wife pointed out that's because we're getting older and time is flying. And I said, shush, I don't need <laughs> to hear your negativity. But yeah, the Henry Cavill one came out five years ago. That's insane to me. Yeah. Uh, it's been 11 years since he was first Superman, just to yeah. put that in perspective. Yeah, yeah. Time is, so, time is swimming very fast. I don't like it. Yeah. Uh, no, I just had a lot of bullshit phone calls to deal with this week, so that was <laughs> that, that ruined my Monday to Wednesday and messed up my schedule and, and whatnot. But there's some new TV shows to watch. I've been reviewing those. Uh, I didn't see as many movies this week, but uh, I did finally do my top 10 of 2023. I, I, I watched... Oh. The Iron Claw, which was kind of the last one I wanted to tick off before I made that list. Did you uh, ugly cry? Because I ugly cried. I didn't ugly cry. It, it yeah. didn't, I, I, t- like, I, I do tear up in movies, but I tend yeah. to get more happy tears than I do sad. So, like, uh, okay. Sad stuff tends to make me... Like, I feel it, but I'm very stoic when yeah. I feel sad. Uh, I, I wish I was you, because, man, Iron Claw, hooey, the tragedies keep on hitting. Yeah, uh, but... How happy stuff! If if they've if they've hit me just right, that that'll mm-hmm. be what gets me going. But uh, now that movie was very good, uh, mm-hmm. well performed. Uh, it's a bit weird. So for those of you who don't know, Iron Claw is a mm-hmm. movie about uh, this this family in wrestling in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Well, most of the eighties. It dips a little yeah. bit either way. But uh, where the the dad was like super like controlling and sort of like mm-hmm. forced all of his sons to to get into the wrestling business. And it's a family that was just littered with tragedy uh, through it. I won't sort of say what it all is, but yeah. what's so weird about it, though, is they actually cut out a whole brother from real life. And apparently one of the reasons why they cut out a, a brother <laughs> is because they thought it would be so absurdly dark and sad that they thought the audience who didn't know the story would start to question how true it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like, we, we want to be true to life. However, this is too much. Um... Yeah, so some very good performances in there, and I saw it with my brother, which might might have been why there's mm. a lot of brother dynamics, why I felt so emotional in it. Um, and uh, to, to add to the Ric Flair discourse, I'm, I'm kind of glad that it's a very bad version of Ric Flair, because that's it, what that man deserves. 
I mean, so, he, he is the worst part of the movie, though. Because yeah. at least if, if you know wrestling and you know like who that is, mm -hmm. he's the worst part because he sticks out like a sore thumb. Is just not sounding right. <laughs> like yep. just not acting right. You know. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it was it was a good time though. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. happy to get my top ten done. I can kind of just start to watch uh, different once, things. Once this goes off, I'm gonna I'm gonna compare notes. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah. If anyone wants to check out my top ten movies mm -hmm. of the year, uh, it went out on Friday, uh, just before this goes out. So, uh, over Mail Fuzz Movies on YouTube, if you want to check that out. Uh, but uh, yeah, so you know, that was, was an okay week overall. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I just feel relieved in the back half to just be, be done with phone calls and yeah, can get onto some other stuff. Do, do you get anxious on the phone like I do? I hate having to make phone calls. Oh like, yeah, I, I, I the like and Joe is so yeah. frustrating uh, about these types of phone calls is that this mm -hmm. week like I had to psych up for the first one. Like I was really having to psych mm -hmm. up because I need to get in the right headspace. I hate calling people. I hate dealing mm -hmm. mysterious stuff where I, I I'm convinced it's going to go. Like somehow I'm going to be in jail by the end of the phone call because it's going to go that badly. <laughs> that's and, Pete. That's how I am when I have to order pizza. So I get it. <laughs> like, right. And then you make the phone call. You get an automated voice that takes five minutes asking questions, and then they just hit you with, "Oh, sorry, we're having too many calls right now. Try again later." And hangs up. And I'm like, right. So it took it took like five phone calls just to get hold music. I actually cheered when I got to hold music. I wasn't happy fifty minutes later when the hold music finally yeah. stopped and I got a person. Yeah. But yeah, so yes. Uh so having to set yourself up for a phone call and then having to like try probably mm -hmm. a dozen times over three days to actually get through and have the conversation you need to have. Not a fun week. But hey. Yeah. So me and my wife have been married for eleven years and she still yells at me when I ask her to make phone calls for me. Like, if it's something for me, like a doctor's appointment thing, I can struggle through. But if it's literally anything else, <laughs> I just, I, it's like this weird social anxiety where I just hate having to talk on the phone, especially since texting has been developed and emails and all that stuff. I much rather do it that way. Um, oh, so, yeah. yeah. I, I can only tell you the lifesaver, the online food ordering, you know, versus mm -hmm. the ordering takeout on the phone. Like that, that yep. change when I was, I don't know what age I would have been, maybe a bit early 20s whenever that mm -hmm. change happened where all of a sudden all of your local because okay the big chains probably yeah. had it a bit first but once things like just eat or uber eats and all these things mm -hmm. where you could just order your local chinese your local indian mm -hmm. whatever it may be online oh great cut out the humans the less yes. humans i have to talk to the absolute better uh so you bring up chinese food there are my local chinese place are very mean on the phone which only adds to <laughs> However, I love how direct they are because it's like dealing with the machine. Okay. You know? And so I can call them because it's, okay, what do you want? All right, how much of it? All right, it'll be this much. Do you, do and, you think that's not necessarily them being rude, but just more the, maybe they're concerned about people understanding them over the phone, so they've just it, learned very direct phrases that are... It, oh, it could be. Because yeah. I've, I've read stories of, like, if you want to find a good Chinese place in the States, look for a place with, like, three stars and where the reviews are like service was so so but the food was amazing because that's kind of the the gimmick mm. here with the you know uh with with the chinese culture here in america is they they're not very into customer service they're very much into getting you you for food and stuff and that's how you know and that's my local place is very much like that uh and i've even checked with my father-in-law who's from new york and that's all of how his favorites were uh there so uh, that's how you know a good one. But I appreciate them helping me with my phone anxiety by just being direct and to the point. Uh, to you know, I don't have to be on the phone with them for very long. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, shall shall we talk about? Uh, we, uh, you, you know, we shall. It's comic solid top ten. Well, the, the less formally known is the comic solid top yes. ten. And its days are numbered as a dual day list, but for a few more months, we're still doing yep. this dance. Uh, so, Matt, would you care to guess what the number one book as of right now is on Comixology from Tuesday? I am looking. Not not a lot of flashy. And Detective hasn't been selling a lot. Mm. Um, I'll go Green Arrow just on a whim. I can't believe you got that right. But yeah, it's Green Arrow. Oh, let's go. <laughs> Also, apologies to the, the audio listeners for the clap right into the microphone. 
Many apologies. I got very excited. <laughs> Just clap above your head or so. If you have to clap. I'm please. sorry. So I, as a right-handed person, my, my thing is always to go down to the left. And my, my mic's on my left, so didn't think that out. <laughs> Clearly, yeah, Green Arrow was number one. I I don't know why, <laughs> but <laughs> oh, you'll find out why. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I look forward. Uh, number two is Flash. Number three is Detective Comics. Number mm -hmm. four is Jay Garrick Flash. Five is Batman: Brave and the Bold. Six is Power Girl. Seven is the Penguin. Uh, I guess that goes to show that like it does matter a little bit what the thing is because tom king mm -hmm. does normally sell but i feel like maybe the penguin's just a bit of a, a hard sell as a as a big seller but fair yeah. enough uh number eight is amazon's attack and then we're we're low on books this week because we've got a collection for number nine which is the mm -hmm. justice society of america uh volume one you know the jeff john series that's uh currently mm -hmm. going and then number 10 is harley quinn so harley quinn got outsold digitally by a collection this week wow. so Wow, yeah, the covers must be keeping that afloat, because... I assume it is, yeah. I, I, ass <sighs> I assume Freaks for Harley Quinn buy every variant cover, and that yeah. just keeps the sales nice and healthy for them. You know, I'll have to look next time, next on one of these weeks, next time I go to the shop and look, um, and see how many my local shop has. Like, mm. see if that's what it is. Yeah, but, uh, so Wednesday, uh, our Marvel and the rest of the industry day, for mm -hmm. now, Got a guess for uh, number one? I, I only, I'll only i have a slight uh, addendum. Is it a Marvel book or is it an, another independent? It's Marvel. It's Marvel. Okay. So I'm going to go with the Resurrection of Magneto. Uh, that is correct. Yep. Boom. Uh, number two is Dead X-Men, issue two. I assume that was the other choice you made. Uh, uh, for, for Marvel, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, number three is Avengers Twilight, number which has a Alex Ross cover, but it looks yes. like it. Uh, number four is Wolverine. Number five is Invincible Iron Man. Number six is our only non-Marvel book, which is Duke, issue five, or issue three, sorry. Mm -hmm. That's a, a Williamson book. Mm -hmm. uh, number seven is Immortal Thor. Number eight is Cable. Number nine is Amazing Spider-Man. Really, Amazing Spider-Man's been outsold by Cable and Iron Man and Thor? That's surprising. That's not normal. I. It seems like it's, you know, the, the fans are... I don't say they're revolting because they're still buying it, right? But I don't think they're buying like they used to. It's that John Romita Jr. effect. That's what that is. <laughs> What's the story? I haven't heard a lot of good things from the people I yeah, know that like Spider-Man. The only thing I know about it is that they, like... What's the word I'm looking for? They unceremoniously killed off Kamala mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the Spider-Man book. Uh, and I just saw people criticizing the shit out of that. Uh, which did sound like a dumb choice from everything I heard, but I obviously I haven't read it myself. Yeah, only to resurrect her as an actual mutant as opposed to what she was. Yes. Uh, so, you know, everyone's kind of saw the writing on the wall and like, whatever. But um, I don't actually hate this J.R.J.R. Uh, JR cover with Madame Mask. Um, it, mm. it helps that it's Madame Mask, Mask and there's not a lot of expression already. <laughs> so we're good to go. Yeah. But, uh, uh, number yeah. 10 is Giant Size Fantastic Four just to, to round that off uh, so yeah no, a lot, a lot of Marvel books out uh, this week judging for the fact that the mm -hmm. next like 20 also seem to have a lot of them but uh, mm -hmm. okay uh, yeah not much to add there uh, which is to say you know, I, I would love to like read a few X-Men books every month I really would but mm -hmm. I, feel, I feel just so lost with wherever it is I I feel like our day is coming because it seems like they're wrapping up the Utopia stuff and it seems mm. seems like we'll be getting yet another X relaunch. So we, we can maybe hop on then. Interesting. So we do have a, a couple of bits of news, not for comics themselves specifically, but mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for movies, for, for the Superman movie in particular. Uh, number one, it started principal photography. So it mm -hmm. shouldn't now. Uh, again, release date is July next year. So yeah, they've got about a year and well three months to four months to, mm -hmm. to get it done. Sounds about right. And I feel like gun works quick. Cause I remember when guardians three went into production and then it came out, it seemed like there was about the same amount of time. Hmm. Uh, number two is that the titles changed. It's no longer Superman legacy. They seem to have just dropped the legacy and mm -hmm. they're going with Superman, which honestly I think is a better choice just because mm -hmm. legacy did sound a bit strange for the first movie in a new series. 
Mm-hmm. If anything, I would argue Legacy sounds like the final movie <laughs> in a series. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, pro- probably a wise choice there. Uh, and then the third thing... Well, actually, no, there's, there's two more things. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll get to the last thing last because we can comment on that a bit more. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we finally got a casting for Perry White. Uh, they mm-hmm. announced... Uh, Wendell Pierce, who most people will probably know as Bunk from The Wire, which is a very Gee. interesting choice. Oh, he didn't say that. That's not Bunk. Yeah, that was Bunk. Oh, maybe he said it I, too. But the, the famous clip that everyone always yeah. says, it's, it's like a lawyer who says it, right? There's like a lawyer yeah. character in the show who always goes, she I So I watched, I've only seen the first season and then the one episode of season two. I'm pretty sure that was Bunk's thing. He says shit a lot. I don't know if he says it. Maybe yeah. he does say it. Maybe it's been a while yeah. since I watched it, to be yeah, fair. Yeah, yeah. The, the scene that sticks out in my head when I think of Bunk, even though he's in the whole show, uh-huh. is the scene with him and McNulty just communicating in nothing but yep. F-bombs for about two minutes yep. as they look at a crime scene. So yes. all I could see in my head right now is Lois coming into Perry's office and him just being like, fa, fa, fa. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. I, I, and I want her, I want him the one thing, because I feel like he has that swagger, is I want that the, he, he corrects her spelling, right? The one thing from the comics I want in there. But you know? with enough F-bombs. Yes. Next time. Uh-huh. <laughs> There's only one F and F-bomb, Lois. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> that would be, oh my God, that would be great. But yeah, uh, that that's their one use of it, too. Yeah. You know, PG-13. Like yeah, I mean, they're not going to put an F-bomb in a Superman movie. Not yeah, in a Superman I'm, movie, I'm, I'm, but I'm, if they did... But if they did. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think it's an interesting choice. Like, he's not someone I would have thought of, but as soon as they said it, I was like, okay, okay, I can see him, you know. I guess I feel like he can play grumpy but lovable. Yeah. And that's kind of that's Perry in a nutshell. And I, I feel like Lawrence Fishburne was kind of wasted because we never really got a Perry White. Like, he was never the focus of a lot of things, right? I mean, um, that movie just kind of underused a lot of the characters from the, yeah. the, the mythos. Uh, uh, Jimmy Olsen says hi. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, no, I think this is an interesting choice. Uh, I'm curious to see what they do uh, with, with the with the Daily Planet side of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the last bit of news uh, to go along with this is less news and more just sort of a first glimpse of some, how something looks. Is uh, Along with the news of this uh, shooting starting, is they put out a photo of the logo on the chest of the, mm-hmm. the outfit. Uh, there's some snow, implying that they're maybe shooting some Fortress of Solitude stuff or something to start with. But uh, we get a look at the logo, and it looks kind of Kingdom Come inspired, although with the traditional colours. So it's still yellow yeah. uh, in the background. Mm-hmm. But it looks like it's more simplified, and it's more just the, uh, the almost just the one straight line going through it rather than mm-hmm. like the more traditional S. Feeling yeah, is the on more... the logo? I think it's fine because judging from some of the, the casting that I've heard about, it seems like we're getting a little Superman and the Authority vibes. And that was in the mm. Morrison book. That was his costume, although it was a lot darker. It was closer to the Kingdom Come. So the fact that Gunn's choosing like this is, it tells me that he's a little bit older of a Superman. But he still hasn't lost that that brightness, you know, uh, and I and I'm okay with that. So it when it was still Superman Legacy, it made a lot of sense. Now that it's going back to Superman, I'm I'm more curious, you know. I mean, but I don't think that changes anything in the story. I mean, I think they've specifically said that it's an early days. Super- I mean, it's not an origin mm-hmm. story, but it's still a young yeah. Superman. So uh, mm-hmm. maybe it's just more of a symbolic thing to take that logo yeah. from Kingdom Come and. Obviously, they've touched it up because they've turned the colours to, mm-hmm. to red and yellow, the traditional logo. Yeah. Uh, but interesting choice, all the same. Yeah, I definitely, you know, I have, I have a much more positive on this than I did of the, the Brandon Routh when Returns was coming out. Mm. You know, because that always looked a little bit too small to be a Superman logo. Um, but but yeah, uh, the, the colours are bright and I'm very happy for that. Yeah, yeah, the colours look vibrant, which is nice. Uh, obviously, the Cavill suit was very muted because mm-hmm. uh, it was maybe this grim, dark world <laughs> that, that mm-hmm. he was in. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, all the signs are positive. It's hard to necessarily just be excited, necessarily. There was, there was like, a cast photo uh, of them on, like, first day of shooting that they put out mm-hmm. as well 
or maybe it was the day of the table read, but you saw, you saw yeah. the line, and I was like, oh yeah, that's right, Felion's playing Guy Gardner, I completely forgot mm-hmm. about that. So it's like, they're determined to make me like Guy Gardner by casting someone I like in the role. Mm-hmm. But, all right. It's gonna enough. work. It's it, gonna work. It, it probably will work. But... Well, you'll at least like Felion's Guy Gardner. Yes. yes, yes, I think that's probably how it's gonna go. So, yeah, um, here's hoping. Here's hoping we get a good Superman movie. Uh, it would be nice. I, yeah, I saw a TikTok that Rachel Broderson, who's playing uh, Lois, mm. put up that had um, Holt and Corn Sweat poke their heads in at the end. And uh, it's kind of the first reveal of the Lex and Clark and Lois. And it just felt right, like seeing them uh-huh. in motion. So I'm excited. Her as Lois, they, I mean, it's not like exactly you can, you know, she's, she's playing a reporter. She just has the Lois vibe, though. The way her hair was, the the kind of clothes she was wearing, it felt ripped from the comics, and that makes me feel a lot better. Mm. Yeah, no, I hope it's good. And I hope if it is good, it's financially, like, compensated for it. Because I, I think there is a slight concern, at least for me, <laughs> that mm-hmm. the world in general is so sick of superhero stuff that even if a Superman movie yeah. comes out now and is perfect, that it might not actually... You know, be a big hit because of where we are in terms of like fatigue. Wouldn't be the first time that that kind of fatigue has hit Superman. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yay! Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be there. I'll be there first showing, first day. So, yeah, you know. I mean, hopefully uh, it all works out. Uh, but I, I feel like the general superhero feeling from the larger audience. You know, things are bombing now. I mean, Madam Web. Obviously, it's a bad movie from everything I've heard. Yeah, but. It seems like that's just killing Sony's attempt at this greater Spider-Man universe, which we can all be thankful for, obviously, yes. in that case. But yeah, you know, it just like it feels like the bubble has burst somewhat, and I do wonder if, uh, you know, but so yeah. Oh, I'm just laughing that, right. that Feige's like, yes, Sony, keep failing, then they'll all be ours. <laughs> and like you know, you're never going to see an MCU version of Madam Web. Yeah, I don't think or... Feige wants to do M- Madam Web. <laughs> No, but I just like the idea that, you know, Sony was notoriously playing hardball when it came to the spider characters. So I just feel like he's he's laughing a bit at the Morbiuses and the Madam Webs and the, you know, who asked for these. I don't think he is, right? I think the MCU's yeah. in the, a dark place right now. Between the last, like, two or three movies mm-hmm. underperforming, the fact that they're having to sort of, like, pivot hard from Kang because everything went on with not only the actor, but also the performance of the movie that he was in. Like uh, the MCU is in rocky territory right now, so yeah. But he, at least Feige can be boy. Like at least we're not Sony, you know. Oh, I was sure, but that's a low bar. <laughs> yeah, like uh, you know, it's a very, um, very, very low bar. <laughs> yeah. Again, I, I watched Loki season two a couple weeks back, and it was better than I had expected. Um, you know, so to see the TVA stuff pop up and Deadpool, and I feel like. Not necessarily there's a renewed interest, but I feel like there's a little bit of a buzz coming back with stuff like the Fantastic Four announcement and Deadpool and some of these other properties. It, it's It's been a minute since we've had those. So there's almost like a um, like like a novelty kind of to it. And we'll see if that lasts, you know. Um, but I, I definitely feel like there's a, a not quite a resurgent, but there's a, a healthy buzz around some of these things. Uh, I'll take your word for it. I've not felt any yeah. of that, but I mean, we'll see. It's funny that I've become the court, uh, the correspondent, the comic book correspondent, comic book movie on our comic book show. You know, because uh, even even before Connor disappeared into the Phantom Zone, uh, he was already out on a lot of these things. So um, I'm still here. Yeah, I'm not going to watch Aquaman 2. Don't ask me to. <laughs> I mean, ask me to, but uh, show me the money. All right. <laughs> All right. That is uh, that is the news. We can get into the into the books then. So uh, let's, let's, get, let's do it. Detective Comics 1082 Ram V rating with Ricardo Federici and Stefano Raphael on the art. Uh, much like last issue and seemingly going forward in this arc, uh, mm-hmm. rather than have a backup, we have kind of the second plot treated as like a... Well, there is a backup as well, actually. Yeah. But it almost felt like it could be a separate story if they wanted mm-hmm. to just sort of do all the Federici stuff first and then do the Raphael stuff. But instead, yeah. they're kind of treating it like a, an A plot and a B plot that's sort of jumping I, between. And I like the cross-cutting because what it's doing with the... 
idea of Batman, especially in this issue. Mm-hmm. I, I love the cross cutting that they do here. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're talking about Batman kind of in his head in the desert, uh, talking mm-hmm. to Simon Hart. Uh, a lot of this issue is Hart, you know, basically making Batman sort of question this idea that he could have done better or more if he just paid for a bunch of stuff rather than putting on the costume and beating up criminals kind of thing. This idea that he has to be the myth, he has to be the legend, mm-hmm. or it's, it's all for nothing. Um Meanwhile, in Gotham, we see that the reality engine is making people forget Batman and Montoya. The questions try to remember it, and Cash shows up, and mm-hmm. Batgirl sort of making people remember what a bat is. You know, not not the animal, but yeah, uh, what what the members are. Yeah. And it's what I liked about that is there's a line that Montoya says before I put the faceless mask on. I was, you know, before the desk, I was a detective, and to counter that with Cass was. Even before she was a bat, she believed in the sense of justice. And it's almost like there's these things that are deeply tied to them that the reality engine cannot affect. And because of who these two characters are, it keeps almost this memory of Batman alive in countering the reality engine. Yeah. Even I, whatever small pieces. I kind of felt like the, the connection between the two stories here was the in Gotham, the reality engine is trying to make people forget who Batman mm-hmm. is, and like people are fighting to keep that memory alive. I almost feel like what Batman's going through in the desert is effectively the same thing inside his own head, mm-hmm. where these mm-hmm. inner demons or, or, or whatever are trying to sort of overwrite or take away what he is. And obviously, mm-hmm. part of it is that Barbados wants to take over and sort of keep going. Um, mm-hmm. They are here, of course, as gorgeous. Federici's killing yep. it. There's like a sort of jester character who represents the Joker. Um, and there's a whole thing here where Batman jumps to save him when he leaps off a building. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's all, again, it's all very kind of visual representation um, of the type of craziness that surrounds him. And Dr. Hart keeps trying to show him, hey, here's your city uh, with everything fixed. Like, this, mm-hmm. this could be what you have. This could be what you get. And again, some of the art here is great. There's, there's like him fighting the, the monster in the, the desert. And mm-hmm. it's just all the shades of the, the oranges for the sand. Very, very yeah. beautiful. Very pretty. Uh, so, like, all that stuff's good. I mean, it's, I think it's always a bit of a risk when you're doing kind of like a in a character's head kind of issue. I remember us being very frustrated when it was like seven issues of that in a row with Tom King uh, during mm-hmm. Nightmares. As much as we have praised Tom King pretty endlessly since then, like, he had a rough patch on that Batman run that was mm-hmm. definitely frustrating. Um, I think... Breaking it up with a more straightforward side to the story in Gotham, with other characters who are just being told traditionally, is doing a lot to help make it feel like we're not just dangling in sort of obscurity the entire time. I mm-hmm. think that was a very wise choice. I think Ram V knew if it was just going to be three, four issues of this in Batman's head, that it would probably be unfulfilling to actually read that month to month because it would feel like not a lot of movements happening each cool. time. And then it also you feel like you're losing what's happening in Gotham without him, right? So the fact that we're able mm. to go back to Gotham and see what's happening since, uh, I think, is a nice balance in his story. Because as much as the story has been about Batman, it's been also about Gotham. So we're not losing that character here at all. For sure. Uh, so, yeah, in Gotham, Montoya, of course, was investigating that cop that got killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, the perpetrator, she found him dead, uh, seemingly via suicide, last issue. Uh, maybe not though. And right. she's following someone who she thinks she's in, who's connected to it. This is where Cass sort of swoops in and takes this guy out. Really fun sequence, you know, name panel grid. Mm-hmm. And and the fact that um this artist, uh, who's it again, Raffaele? Uh, yeah. Um, the fact that he almost makes Cass look like like a demon herself. Right. Mm-hmm. Because she's she's kind of spindly and it's almost like this is the version he's seeing in the head, not remembering what, uh, you know, not remembering what Batman was, you know. Uh, so it gives her a otherworldly look and really drives home the reality engine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Montoya has to stop Cass from knocking him out because she has to ask him some <laughs> questions. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was good. It's after this where the whole thing with Batman like collapsing in the desert and like uh, Hart comes down with the blimp <laughs> to be like, hey, mm-hmm. come up and look at your city, uh, kind of thing. Um, and he even was- yeah, he has to jump out and save because uh, 
he, like a big bat drone starts like firing at like criminals in the street mm. and uh batman has to you know jump out and stop them and blow up the the, the big drone thing it's a really, again really fun art sequence like is like mm-hmm. the i think because everything's shaded blue with touches of green when you get to that page where the the thing explodes and it all turns orange and red it's actually yeah. really effective you really feel the difference in the art yeah um, on, on the story side of this, I'm kind of confused at what Ramvi's going for or what, what Hurt's going for outside of Barbados trying to get full control. Because the first thing with the gesture is if if Bruce Wayne tried to take on the problems that Batman does, everything would be solved because he has all this money. It's mm-hmm. it's that stupid idea that you, that comes up every you know two years or so of how come Bruce Wayne doesn't just solve the crime by giving away his money. And uh, the whole idea of the Jester or the Joker character being there is, you know, he's he jumps off of that um, he jumps off of that tall building because he's like, well, what's the point of of me when everybody else is happy, right? Like, there's there's no reason for a Jester, and it was kind of this just idea of with without I, I took that as that's almost Batman, right? It's in the form of the Joker because that's his great thing, but. You know, if Bruce does this, there's no reason for a Batman, right? And then in the next thing that we get is almost this authoritarian version of Gotham where Bruce is given complete control of Batman to to him. And it's all rules and it's all, you know, he says here that, um, uh, where's it at? The, the, uh, it's a city of fear with one hero and everyone else is a villain. And uh, that's where Bruce jumps in and stops the the drone and stuff. And, you know, so I'm trying to figure out what Hurt's trying to say, because to me, all it's doing is telling Bruce, like, you're both of these, right? Like, well, no, you can't I, give I, one to the other. I, I think I get what the, 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 the progression here is between the two sequences. Mm-hmm. He's basically getting to this idea that he needs Batman in some mm-hmm. way, not because it's the healthy thing, but he needs to be the myth. He needs to be the legend. Mm-hmm. And this, this society shows him that has these bat drones just hunting people. It's mm-hmm. this idea that eventually when he can't do it anymore, he will still try and live in the myth. He'll tr- he'll still try and build mm-hmm. up the legend of who Batman is because that's what makes him feel alive. So this is a city that sort of represents what will happen if we get to that point and obviously batman jumps out to save these people because Mm -hmm. he's still batman like this is the the nuance is lost on this eddie's head version of heart Mm -hmm. but i I think that's kind of what he's he's getting at it's really questioning this idea of like is the myth bigger than the man and is he kind of consumed by it now Mm -hmm. and i think that kind of plays into what some of the stuff that the the arguments are like doing with the city and the idea that they're trying to deconstruct the myth but as we're seeing in the Gotham stuff, it's more than that. Other people believe mm-hmm. in it. Other people right. see the value in it. And I think that's the key point of Cass saying that that, that quest for for justice or, or vengeance mm-hmm. or whatever, was, that drive was already in her before she ever met Batman because Montoya right. asked her that. Mm-hmm. I think that's the idea that, like, they're not all just like this because he exists. Yes, obviously right. she wears a bat costume. He he made that a mm-hmm. symbol that others could latch on to. Right. But it's... who they are at their core is still them. Right, okay. Because I'm just going, like, if the whole purpose of this thing in the desert is, you know, it's Barbados wrestling for control from the asthma, yet the Barbados is showing Bruce, like, hey, look, if you just give me full control, this is what's going to happen. It seems like it's backfiring, right? Like... Because Bruce is going to realize, again, I'm thinking, he, like you said, he has to be the man that is also the legend. Uh, you know, and that's kind of what Batman is. He's that symbol in the Nolan movies. That's what he says. You know, I can be more than just a man. Uh, and I can, you know, continue with the symbol. Yeah, I think the idea here is, is that maybe he's bought into that too much, right? To the yeah. point where now for him, the line of like who he is and what the myth is is maybe blurring or at least that's what these inner mm. voices are okay. kind of like poking at yeah uh, so I, I like i think all of this stuff looked really great and it was definitely kind of mm-hmm. this analysis of the character it is a little unfortunate that it feels like it's tackling similar sort of inner demon questions that the mm-hmm. main batman one is this is doing it much much better yeah, yeah it's, right but yeah. it is kind of funny that that other book right now is doing all this oh who is batman really in here with all these zero and r's mm-hmm. running around and you know who is yeah. the real batman well, sort of thing it, it's just and I just feel like the difference between Zdarsky and Ram V is like 
Ramvi is very adept at, at taking the abstract and making a story out of it, right? Like that's what his swamp thing was. It was a story about s- stories in, you know, um, and, and ideas given life. Same with the vigil. So here it's just like the idea of Batman versus with Zdarsky. It's like, yeah, he can tell a pretty fun superhero story, but I feel like he loses a lot of that nuance. And that's, that's the big difference here is, uh, you know, Ram V is working with a scalpel. Zdarsky is working with a sledgehammer. You're going to get different things coming out, but you're right. It's unfortunate because you can't help but compare. Yeah. Cause I was like, man, this is, this is a good version of what's going on over there. And, I just the idea of Barbados being this cosmic, this cosmic entity that got it its mitts on a young Bruce with the tragedy of his parents, and has been there with him the whole time. Uh, yeah, I yeah. just well, it's kind of scary. Yeah, whether you actually sort of read that as literally something that's latched onto him, or just a mm-hmm. representation of the grief that's in him, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I think that's what right. makes it compelling to me. Uh, so yeah, the big thing is that uh, Montoya gets from this guy they're questioning uh, that uh, you know the Argum lady, what's her name, uh, uh, Shavad. Yeah, she she's the one doing all this. She's the one broadcasting these messages and using the reality engine to to manipulate everything. Mm-hmm. So uh, the final page though is interesting. Uh, basically, uh, Talia is waiting for Bruce, mm-hmm. expecting him to like have already been there by now. Like he's taken too long. And her mm-hmm. men have found someone. We don't get to see who. We just know that he's bloody because he's got a bandage over his head. Mm-hmm. And then there's a glimpse of whoever caused this violence. Uh, we just see the bottom half of whoever it is. Mm-hmm. I think the obvious guess here is Flamingo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I got super excited because Flamingo was one of my favorite characters. It's not been used a lot. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that Batman Inc. style run where these different, you know, we have to see a lot of these different villains pop up. Um, and, and it's cool because Flamingo works with a lot of blades, you know, so I'm sure we'll see Talia versus Flamingo. It'll be a fun mm. fight sequence. And it's just fun to have different villains pop in, you know? Well, I mean, it, uh, I think more interesting to me is why is he here? What's, he's, what's, mm-hmm. the, what's he doing? Uh, the fact that he was around in the same run that Dr. Hurt was in when Morrison mm-hmm. was doing stuff, it definitely doesn't feel like an accident. But nope. uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, no, very curious. I feel like this is one of these awkward arcs in the middle of a big run like this, where it's hard to sort of judge it until we have the whole thing to kind of mm-hmm. look at and see what the, the purpose of it all is. Yeah. I can kind of make some broad guesses about, okay, Batman's going to sort of like mentally be more stable when he ultimately like comes to his like realization and wins this mm-hmm. inner fight with himself. But uh, how they do that and like what, what steps we get to, to get there is, is something else. So well, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll we'll see how it pans out. I mean, I, I kind of trust Ram V at this point, to be honest. But, yeah. Uh, well, and, and also, I like the idea that he has to be reborn, and, and who's helping him that is Talia al Ghul. And it might not be Lazarus, right? But he's got to come out of the side of this no, desert. No, it, it's, uh, you know? it's just not a literal Lazarus, but it's a, it's a Lazarus right. and thematically, yeah. Right. And, and I like that. I like that that's that tie to to rebirth and you know i mean it's the same resetting you know it's uh kind of like dark knight rises there's not literally a Mm -hmm. pit in that movie but there's a big well that he goes into that effectively Mm -hmm. acts like a lazarus pit where he comes reborn out of it so yeah um i also want to point out what the organs are doing too it 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 very reeks of fascism right because there's Mm. this sheen that everything on the top is fine right people are walking down the dark streets of gotham hand in hand and Wearing, you know, fancy clothes uh, without fear. However, the Orgums are sending, like, their their shock troops in to remove anybody that would, you know, speak out, right? Anybody that yeah. kind of poses a threat, you know? And so I also like that Ram V's holding that in and that, like, just because things seem perfect doesn't mean, like, you know, above the surface it's not still rotting. Uh, and Gotham is still, you know... It's just a different kind of rotting this time. I mean, it's just a lie anyway. All of it's mm-hmm. a lie. It's all just mm-hmm. this reality engine stuff and influence, mm-hmm. which just kind of is like a, you know, a fictional amplification of what propaganda is. It's just like, yeah. hey, everything's going great. Everything's fine. We're mm-hmm. the best city in the world kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but actually made literal via, you know, science via fiction this, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I like all that too. And again, it's it's all the nuances here because it's still at the end of the day, it's still a superhero story, you know, Batman fighting this representation of the asthma in the desert, and that looks rad. 
you know, but there's, there's deeper things going on here. And that's why, that's why I appreciate Ram V as a writer. Mm. Yeah, uh, definitely. Though, I understand why some people might not be enjoying this part of the, the run as much, the arc, just because it doesn't have as maybe much of it as a clear story that it's going through each issue. You know, it's a bit mm-hmm. more, uh, you know, dreamlike. It's a bit more, yeah. uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Hypnotic, I guess. Uh, yeah, there is there there is this dreamy sense to it in kind of a Lynchian type way, right? Mm. Like stuff seems not quite right. And that's the point, you know, trying your attention to it. Um, but yeah, and that, and to me, it, it's really resonating with me. I just, I, I started reading this one of the nights and I got sleepy. So I put it down and not that it did make an imprint, but I had to go back and read cause there's just so much. So Ramvi's also packing a lot into those, those Federici pages, you know, cause the stuff that did stick with me was a lot more of the, more straightforward Montoya stuff. But all of these bigger yeah. ideas, well, uh, I had to go back and revisit before, you know, when I yeah. picked it back up. That's why I was saying it was, it was smart to have that that subplot kind of be there mm-hmm. as well. It's, it's, it's giving kind of an anchor to everyone who maybe is a bit more frustrated with the dreamlike stuff yeah. to have this constant, like, more normal side to sort of latch onto. And that stuff's also very good uh, mm-hmm. with characters who most people love a lot. So uh, mm-hmm. kind of smart in that sense. Uh, did you read the backup? I did. It's it's the more of the Doctor Hurt stuff, mm. um, and so they they're going in. They notice like uh, has you know Gotham always had this castle, right? Because they're going into this big opulent manor, um, and uh, this is the weird thing too. Is they said you know was there always a castle just outside of Gotham City? They said no. Then how's it here now? So it's kind of making the idea of, of Doctor Hurt as this mythic figure, right? That just kind of makes things happen. And so they're going to sneak into his big, like, masquerade party, and that that's where they're going to kill him. But as they get there, there's all these people wearing more, like, the, the hurt style mask. It's just, like, the eyes. But what these victims of hurt are, are wearing are, like, almost full masks. And so they kind of stick out. And as they're going, one of the, you know, the, the, the one lady um, that was married to Dr. Hurt meets another lady. And it's like, oh, yeah, no, we're all his brides. Like, we were all, he was trying to make an heir, and all of us failed. Like, he still is looking for the heir. And that puts her in, like, this spiral that she ends up leaving the group and and going and grabbing a bottle of wine. Um, So they end up, and there's this guy on stage, um, and he has all of these people in, like, these, like, tubes. And they're all standing there in their underwear, and he's talking about how, they are perfect human specimens, and Dr. Hurt has has done this to show you what perfection can be. And um, as as he's talking about them, they're, you know, they're like um, a, a senior vaccinologist and a pediatric neurosurgeon. Uh, and so they're not just physically perfect, but, you know, socially and, and mentally. And then he he hits them with this gas. And I'm assuming this is meant to be Dr. Hurt on stage, except now he's wearing a mask that's more like the characters that are coming to kill him, which I thought was odd. Um, and these people start in the, the tube, start freaking out that they can't get out. So um, the the our, our heroes, for lack of a better term, are like, we have to do something. Uh, and the guy that was left in the wheelchair pulls out a gun and goes, oh, yeah, I know exactly what to do. And he tells them to run. Um, so, uh, they run, the one, uh, bride is still drinking this wine. They come into this parlor area where everybody is, it looks like they're dead. And the, the one right wife she was talking to is like, oh yeah, no, you know, there's still a little bit of wine left if you want to die with us. So he had poisoned the wine, uh, on this and they go, oh no, cause she's already drunk too much of it. So as we're going, we're whittling down our heroes. Um, they leave her. They go up the steps, uh, the the remaining two, and um, they go to the top of this uh, staircase where there's just a lone throne sitting there. And our and our main guy, the bald guy, is like, oh, man, what a narcissist. Um, and he goes, but where is he? And, and the one last lady that's with him pulls a gun and says, 
he's right here. He always has been, you know, um, you don't, you, you understand perfectly well that I'm also Dr. Hurt. So it's almost as if these experiments that he's done on them is just creating more people like him. Um, and it, it definitely gives the, the vibe is I remember in reading in Morrison's Batman RIP, the sense of Dr. Hurt as the devil and, and this issue um, and this backup, it really felt like a Dante's Inferno. Like the further they get into this thing, the deeper into hell they descend. And when finally they look for who the devil is, it's, it's, you know, them staring back at themselves. And this is like their own personal hell. Um, and so the fact that Dan Waters is able to navigate this, despite not like, I don't remember any of these characters names. I barely remembered mm. what they were doing for just this small chapter. It was very compelling. So I got to give them credit. Um, and the art by Christopher Mitten is, is it's pretty good. Like the layouts, the layouts are there. It's just, everything's a lot uh, behind these masks. And, you know, you lose some of the expression going on there because they're all kind of these heavy, heavier, almost opera style masks that you'd see. So um, the colors are all there. Everything's kind of in these like greens and blues. Um so there's a like this unifying sense. Uh, the the deeper they get into the into this house, the the darker things get. So it goes from you know lighter blues to darker to purples. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's pretty good. I just you know wish wish again I had remembered more. Like I the the one guy that stuck out the most was the guy that had fallen and ended up in the wheelchair with the halo on because I couldn't tell you what the rest of them were still upset about Doctor Hurt. So that that's the one drawback here. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. well, I mean, oh well, I for whatever reason, I think it's because it obviously I didn't read the last time. So when I saw it this mm -hmm. time as the same, I was like, ah, I'll just leave it. I, I thought you did. Oh, I didn't. No, I did not oh, read this last man, time. I remember, I remember talking about it with you. I thought. I mean, you probably talked about it, but yeah. Mm, all right. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. All right. We we give a detective comics. All right, so uh, as as a whole, I will give it a solid eight. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, a ten sounds right to me as well. Uh, I I like what it's poking at. I love the subplot. Um, I think, you know, there's there's an argument for maybe it to be slightly less dreamlike, maybe would help. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it's hitting that a lot of cool ideas and a lot of fun stuff. So, uh, that is Detective One Thousand Eighty Two. The Flash, issue 6, legacy number 806, size spurrier rating with Mike Diodato Jr. on the R. So, Jesus, you know what? I, I enjoyed a good chunk of this issue, but at the same time, sometimes there'll just be like moments where like they'll be talking to the stillness, and the stillness will use like four or five new terms that I do not recognize, and I'm like, what are you talking about? Arc angles? What's an arc angle? <laughs> So that was the thing that was brought up the last time he talked to them. Uh, I'll tell you right? what they, like, they were like these, <laughs> they were like these guardian spirits or so we thought, you know, when, uh, when they brought them up. But I remember those arc cause we, we, I remember commenting to you that they sound like archangels, right? Yes. So I remember talking about that. Okay. Well, but... do you remember D brain? Cause they say D brain in almost the same speech bubble. What's mm -hmm. a D brain? The D brain was like the, the the membrane that gets them through um, all of this timey wimey type of stuff. Yeah, I, I'm shocked you're remembering any of this. Yeah. Uh, well, I, here's here's the thing. <laughs> I I remember that stuff, and but I wish I wish the context that where they pop up was better because I hate the stillness. I do not enjoy when they come up, and it's almost like these were lear words that I was forced to learn, like in science class. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, I don't like that I remember them. You know, yeah. they, they do nothing to enhance the story. I just, they're just there. And that's the thing. I think the overall story, though, is pretty good. Because mm -hmm. effectively what's happening here is that Wally's taking Linda on a on a job with them for some bonding time. And mm -hmm. the, the narration, which is third person, but kind of like gives it from Linda's perspective, kind of, even though it's not her speaking, mm -hmm. talks about her feelings and how that she's kind of detached right now and that she you know, can see all the effort and she sees why she fell in love with Wally, but she's not feeling anything right now. And there's a great little, like, sort of one-two thing in this where 
there's a moment where Wally's clearly like upset or something's hurting him, mm-hmm. and she describes or the narration describes that Wall uh, that Linda can see that he's hurt, but somehow can't just bring herself to comfort him. But mm-hmm. then there's a moment later when he's upset again, where her hand instinctively goes onto his shoulder, and it's almost like this little hint that no, 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 like deep down, like everything's okay, their feelings are still there. Uh, obviously, mm-hmm. something else is going on here, and by the end of the issue, it does seem like this force from the other dimension or outside of our dimensions is trying to turn Wally into a conduit. So the way that him mm-hmm. and Barry are acting and like their discontent in this issue mm-hmm. and the and, and just the general idea that Wally has been like disconnected from his family and retreating to this kind of like secret, you mm-hmm. know, uh, garden, like in another dimension that he's been going mm-hmm. to like hang out. It feels like it's, you know, again, it's doing that thing where it takes something that happens in real life and is making it more literal. This idea that, you know, sometimes people can shut off and start becoming disconnected mm-hmm. and they'll go, they'll avoid going home and stuff like that. They'll sort of have a secret place, even if they're not doing anything inherently wrong. You, you know, they're not mm-hmm. necessarily having an affair or anything like that, but they're just sort of like trying to avoid being with the rest of the family. It feels mm-hmm. like that's kind of what they're doing here with Wally in this place. But it's also got this added influence of like these villains trying to turn him into a conduit because he's special, because he can channel the speed force in a way that no one else can or or whatever. That broad story, I'm kind of into, and I was enjoying the, the, the narration here talking about how Linda was feeling about everything throughout the issue and this weird thing where she kept wearing this mask because they go to London at the start of the <laughs> yeah. issue uh-huh. and she picks up this like guy's face that's like, just like a mask and she's I like I believe it's supposed to be Winston Churchill admit, yeah that actually sounds right he's got kind of which, a chubby which face which makes it even funnier but she's kind of wearing that for the rest of the issue off and on as she's like not wanting people to see who she is and uh, like I, I thought that was a kind of an interesting little quirky thing but I do agree whenever the stillness show up and start talking I just kind of like okay here we go again yeah so so I, I still appreciate what what's going on here with the with Wally. Like you brought up like this whole idea is that they're isolating him so then they can use him themselves. Um it's just so many of these things that I know we're getting towards the end of the first arc. And so all of these things that we've been introduced to are starting to come up and I just I was starting getting as worn down as Bear or as Wally was. You know, so if that was the intent, like great. But man, that's felt like a lot. Yeah, and it's funny because they you know they brought up uh, one of the things that happens about halfway through the issue is that Jay shows up, young Jay, mm-hmm. and is like, "Hey, something's happened at school." So they all go to his school, and everyone's frozen still, including his sister. And it's mm-hmm. like this is like these anomalies keep happening more and more often because of what's happening with the stillness and the mm-hmm. fabric of reality starting to break down because the speed forces. Well, at least they say it's because of Wally. Obviously, I suspect they might be telling fibs. Yeah. But- they, 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 they see this stuff and I thought, okay, they remind me here because Wally brings up that him and Jay had a talk where Jay didn't want to become a superhero. And mm-hmm. I like that it came up that way because Linda's like, wait, what talk? What's happening? Yeah. Like, what's going on with my son that you didn't tell me? I like mm-hmm. that. It felt like a nice natural thing to have a little bit of contention over. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, I'm also glad you reminded me of that issue because I thought that issue was really good last time. I thought mm-hmm. that was such a focused issue. Uh, probably because it kept away from the stillness stuff uh, yeah. long enough. So I'm actually kind of excited to... like. I can see the stillness still being here after the first arc. I don't know if they're going to just go away, but I'm kind of excited to get past this first phase and sort of let the, the run focus in a little bit more and like yeah. where it's going next. But like I said, the character stuff is really working for me. That moment where Linda puts her hand on his shoulder and it basically just describes that this was instinct, just to sort of show that though that instinct in there to comfort him still there and like who these characters are deep down is still going to sort of ultimately win the day, but we're going Mm -hmm. through a lot of turmoil to get there. Uh, It's it's like they're all being affected by like, not red kryptonite, but like some kind of kryptonite. There's there's a disturbance in the speed force, right? There you go. That's a good way of putting it. And Wally and Wally can sense it. And I feel like Linda's gone through this enough that it's almost like she, she can read him. Right. So that's where the, the touch out of instinct comes from um and and yeah and she gets pulled along i like that page too where the art gets all psychedelic when he jumps sideways and because she has her hand on his shoulder it gets all this like psychedelic and she can kind of see the garden too right 
Um, so that's like the closest that she can get to understanding yeah. him. Yeah, there's basically a glimpse of it, and he just kind of brushes it off because he doesn't yeah. want to explain it. Which mm-hmm. was what really made me think of that idea of, oh, that's my secret man yep. cave. I can't tell her about, uh-huh. and she's recognizing that he's hiding something that he's keeping mm-hmm. secrets. Like that, yep. that, that stuff I'm really liking because I feel like it, yep. I feel it's feeling very true to me. It's feeling like it, not, yeah. not so much that this conflict's coming from like it's clearly influenced it's, by this outside force yeah. but it feels like real character conflicts in real life uh being yeah. put into the characters it's, and i think that's it's good. still a like human feeling that that wally needs a place to to go to to kind of uh decompress and i'm sure linda would understand that if he just explains it to him but he's being pulled in four different directions you know, well, and now the fact that he's keeping it a secret, it's almost to her like, wait, what? what is going on? Well, it's not just that, though. Like I say, I think she's also been affected by this outside force. Uh, mm-hmm. Or at the very least, that's also much, like I said, it's heightening what he's going yeah. through. Um, we kind of talked about how she may have some postnatal uh, depression mm-hmm. um, and mm-hmm. previous issues. It feels like she's been kind of down since the baby came. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe, again, that's been taken and heightened by yeah. you know, whatever else is going on. But yeah, like Barry at one point starts talking with someone else's voice. Like the the, the bubbles change to blue, yep. and clearly someone else is talking to Wally through him. Um, and then we get like where it gets really trippy, where it's like there's these two other voices talking that the stillness are reporting to. It's like two voices. I mean, for lack of a better mm-hmm. term, I'm just going to say gods here, but I don't think yeah. they actually are gods. But I'm just going to say it's like two gods are talking, and the stillness are reporting everything that was went on. And a nice touch here in the art is that the glass is shattered as a almost like reality shattering and we're seeing who's behind the you know the interrogation room mirror almost. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the end of the issue uh, basically refers to what's coming as the crown of thorns. Uh, and we see <laughs> we see what looks like maybe a reverse flash surrounded by other flash villains. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, the fact that a thon might be behind all this, like, sure, okay, maybe maybe you like that, maybe you could complain that, oh, it's just sure. thon again, somehow, but, I mean, I don't know. It's thon, but made up of a bunch of smaller thons. <laughs> you know? It, it, um, it's going really trippy with these, uh, next plan to try and take well, over. I'm wondering, too, because we never, we've never gotten any closure on him when Dr. Manhattan, you know, blew him up. Right from from the button all those years ago. Oh yeah, is, is it possible he's like finding his way back through reality uh, through uh, all through this, this, this? Yeah, speed force same fabricy time shit. I don't yeah, even know what so, to call it. Because <laughs> they they call Wally the Sinisher, which sounds like a like a like uh, like a closure, like yeah. a suture. Uh, again, another just really weird word that they're using in this like it's an normal right. word <laughs> right and so they're they're talking about how he is the strongest link there is right and you know which makes sense because we've you know for you know barry's the first flash that touched the speed force right but wally's been the one that was learning to do different things with his abilities right through the wade run through the john's run through all this other stuff and so you know and him also kind of being the crux of the flash family a lot like the way that Night Nightwing's kind of the crux for the DCU as a whole, mm. and so the fact that it's almost like the Speed Force, while it doesn't flow through him, he has more connections to it, and so if someone's going to tamper with the Speed Force, it's going to be through Wally, yeah, and then you I, give us. I, I, I kind of like the idea actually that uh, like because Thon's tied to Barry, like that's his nemesis. Mm-hmm. I do kind of like this idea that. He has this realization that Wally's actually the one that's more connected to the speed force. So whatever mm-hmm. he's going to do, he has to go through him instead. That's... But it also makes sense that he would enjoy like making them hate each other. That he would enjoy mm-hmm. you know taking control of Barry and like talking through him or whatever. Yep. You know. Uh, yeah, that and that's where I was getting is like it's gonna hurt more, you know, through Wally than it is to Barry because he sees Wally as the the biggest you know. Like they called him the Sinisher or whatever, but he's he has the strongest connection. So it's everyone's gonna feel the hurt more mm. if it comes through him versus Barry. And that's all he ever wants to do, right? Is destroy the Flash family. Yeah, and it's almost like he's breaking him down to his lowest point by trying to sever mm-hmm. all of his like human connections uh, mm-hmm. to make him vulnerable to whatever he's doing. So like yeah. all that's interesting, you know, and I still I'm enjoying this like consistent art style that we've had. Obviously I like mm-hmm. the art in general, but this 
these layouts where there's these extra bits of panels that are around the border all the time. Um, my favorite part in this issue is actually when Linda puts his hand or hand on his shoulder, mm-hmm. it comes in from one of those sort of extra panels at the side. So it's coming from mm-hmm. off the page. So it feels like the art's representing it was a surprise that the, yeah. the hand touched his shoulder, like he's surprised. Uh, and the art kind of represents that. It's actually, it's a really nice use of that. It's almost like mm-hmm. they decided on this sort of uh, style for, for this this book and they've been able to find ways of using it to represent different things. For example, on the very next page, when the stillness show up, they sort of like dip out into that extra panel as well, again, implying that they're coming from outside of the regular world. There's just there's all these little things they do with like the placement of coming outside of these other panels. They make it feel like they're, they're being, not in the same way every time, it's always different how they're using them, but mm-hmm. it feels like they're really utilizing them. And it's, it's kind of interesting because it's not a, I mean, it's not the first comic to use this this style or this technique, but Mm-mm. it's made it such a consistent part of its uh, of its DNA. It's been here since the very first part of the run, and I th- I think that maybe that was like a conscious choice because so much of this story is going to be the idea of reality bleeding in from somewhere else and like things becoming less defined. So all these like extra panels around the border are kind of really good at representing that on like a constant visual way. So yeah, yeah, that's that's good. Well. And then looking through that too, and when, you know, Wally gets stabbed and he falls through the glass, right? And then, you know, it starts to form the crown of thorns. All of those, like, tentacles in, you know, they got, like, eyeballs and stuff on them are bleeding into those panels too. So it almost makes it like it's infecting reality as well. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, no. yeah a, lot, a lot of good stuff. Yeah, or, or even just the, the page where, uh, like, some of the, the, the boxes aren't there and the narration just, like, is written on the white. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, it just it gives it this feeling of the of the voice becoming om- omnipotent because it's mm-hmm. in the void rather than on the panels. Like, there's a lot of just good little, like, storytelling craft bits like that, which are, are really nice. Uh, so, no. It's, uh, it's good. Uh, also, since we built up to a reveal that Thawne has something to do with this, the fact mm-hmm. that all that stuff with Barry and Wally up until Barry, who's possessed, effectively stabs him, yep. uh, all of that's taking place uh, in yellow. Like, it's all just yeah. yellow around them. Yeah. So. Well, and even, like, when those goggle things of, uh, you know, the, the thing that Barry had gotten preoccupied with, when they go over his eyes, it makes him look like Zoom. It, right? does, it does, yeah. It does. And I was just like, so looking back at this, I was like, man... Great storytelling where they're they're giving us the hints right before they make the full reveal. Yeah. So Yeah, so there's definitely stuff in it and like sort of some clunkiness to the mythology and like all these extra made up words that are <laughs> being thrown yeah. in. But like the the core drama of it and like the the craft of the actual page to page comic book storytelling mm-hmm. is really strong. So I'm still really liking yeah. the book. But there's definitely always just a little bit of a Ex- there's always just a little bit of extra there that I, mm-hmm. if you just trimmed that extra away, it would it would probably a little bit yeah feel feel even better. And it makes me wonder too that if if that's why Thon got rid of Max, because Max Mercury has this you know he treats the Speed Force like it's this like source of religion, right? It's his mm. it's all about meditation and being Zen and all of that. And I'm wondering if that's why he got rid of Max and that. Max is going to be the key to Wally calming himself down enough to defeat this crown of thorns or whatever. What if it's thon or you know multiple thorns, whatever? And you know, and, and it's obviously, going to be, I don't it, feel I don't feel we have to point this out, but you know, yeah. obviously, crown of thorns is a play on crown of thorns. Crown of thorns, just, just, right? Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering if that's what it is, and that's what the whole idea of the Zen Garden is. Is like this is his this is his happy spot. This is the place where he can slow down enough. You know, and it's kind of in that Max Mercury way of treating the Speed Force as this I mean, Zen thing. If we're going with the, uh, you know, C- Crown of Thorns, like, comparison, that sort of mm-hmm. turns it to religion. Does it make sense that he's trying to manipulate Wally by giving him his own Garden of Eden? Like, if we, mm-hmm. if we go further down the, the religious, like, could, allegories. Could be, could be too, you yeah. know. Him seeing himself as a god, <laughs> yeah. effectively. You know. But but yeah, and I was also trying to figure out who the other villains are because you know I'm pretty sure it's Mirror Master and Grodd. Yeah. But yeah. the the other two, I mean, maybe Weather Wizard and I don't know who the other one is. And those are all 
those are mostly villains that you kind of associate with Barry, not Wally, because Wally has his own rogues. Yeah, and no, you know? notably when reality shatters, it shatters like glass, which does yeah. tie into Mirror Master as Mirror well. Mirror Master. So, you know, so if this is, ends up being these are Barry's villains coming after Wally, I also like that in, in the term of legacy as well, you know, mm. um, that they're, they're trying to use these different guys to get one over on the Flash for whatever reason. Um it just feels very much, despite, like you said, so had all the little extra things, it feels very much like a Flash story. You know, it has that tone to it uh, when you dig deeper. Yeah. All right, what are you giving the Flash, the issue six? Um, I'm going to use an 8.5. I am gonna, just going to go with a straight eight. Uh, like I say, there's just a couple of little nitpicks and, like, clunkiness at times that just, I think, stops it from being truly great. But there's a lot of good stuff in here to really like. All right, Green Arrow issue nine, legacy number three four two. By my count, anyway, until DC corrects me. <laughs> so Joshua Williamson writing with Sean Isaacs back on the art. This is this is your book, Matt. You you take it away. Yeah. So we got uh, Ollie's looking for uh, looking for Roy. He knows that that he's now working for Waller. So what does Ollie do? Is he is going to infiltrate the new Hall of Order? Right, which was formerly known as the Hall of Justice, which Ollie paid for. If you if you go back to the Bendis stuff with the JLA, mm. um, you know that was all coming out of Ollie's pocket. So um, he kind of takes this personal. So he brings up you know the the Beast World stuff and how Waller's taking a step that we're not used to. Um, and the the first part of this is Peacemaker and Peace Wrecker going through and kind of criticizing the Hall of Justice. Um, when Waller shows up, it's with Mr. Bones, which I thought was curious because when, when was the last time we saw him It had to do with some multiversal shenanigans? Um, and so he's part of the, um, this, you know, the, the AXC stuff from Wonder Woman and, and all of this, the government. Um, so, uh, this, this issue also, I love the title is the arrow and the wall. And so it's, it's Ollie um infiltrating the the hall while um his son i'm done with connor is is Who? going through yeah, exactly uh connor hawk uh not connor kent different connor it is funny that connor's disappeared just like connor kent did i'm, <laughs> I'm not gonna yeah yeah <laughs> so it, it's got uh connor hawk going to corto maltese um, and getting into this prison, um, and he's there to recruit somebody And this, this, you know, he says, Oliver Queen needs your help. And the guy swings first and says to hell with queen. And it's revealed to be Diggle, uh, mm. who, you know, and so, uh, you know, uh, he tells him he doesn't deserve to be in that, that prison and that, you know, or they, you know, he's exactly where he deserves to be. Whatever crazy idea, he doesn't care until Connor mentions about taking down Malcolm Merlin. Now Dale's interested. So um, Ollie gets into the the Hall of Justice slash Hall of Order, and there's this weird future thing that pops up with a bunch of bright lights and says that you know Ollie should recognize who this is, um, and you know Ollie's like, well, I don't care. I, I know. When, you know, if anything has is flashing lights, you kind of go for the eyes, you know. And so he stabs this thing in the face uh, into the, one of those eye sockets, which allows him to, you know, get the one up um, until whatever this thing is, uh, starts swinging wildly and ends up knocking out Ollie, which we get some fun uh, Isaac's art here with Ollie seeing stars Uh you know, circling over his head with, with Peacemaker and Peace Wrecker. Um, and they bring him to Waller where they have him like stringed up and um, Peacemaker starts, you know, laying into him with the fists and Amanda goes, you know, um, I, I want you to come work for me. You know, you're very important. You should know this is going to come down to the people with power versus the people like us without power. Um, and cause she had seen on earth three, what had happened when those people got corrupted 
and you know basically completely destroyed themselves um ollie's like no you, you can piss off you know there's not a chance in hell you just need to tell me where roy is and she's like well let's make a deal now i'm really good at deals i need secrets because secrets are the most dangerous thing in the world you know this and he's like all right well if i do this one thing for you can i get roy back and she smiles in the typical Waller way and goes, you know, she brings up that secrets can never be destroyed. That's why they're valuable. And you go to turn the page and Waller says, I need you to steal. And we get a nine panel grid with a bunch of heroes on it, all looking directly at the camera. With the sanctuary mask <laughs> from Heroes in Crisis. <laughs> they won't let it die. <laughs> the one thing I don't talk about that Tom King did, we, we just don't talk about it. I was a Wally fan, right? Wally's my favorite Flash. <laughs> I've ignored that this has happened. As a Tom King fan, we'll talk about the 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 bad parts of his Batman run. But since, since his Batman run, it's been pretty good. So it was funny mm. that when you were bringing that up earlier on the show, I mean, since that run, he's been exceptional, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> but, except yeah. for heroes in crisis. Except for heroes in crisis. Yes. Talk yeah. about it has become the title. We don't talk about yet. Williamson goes, Hey, you remember that thing that nobody seemed to like, I mean, I'm bringing the, it back to you. The first arc of the flash run, the, the last one was just like yeah. this retcon like uh -huh. what happened in that book let's make it clear that wally didn't do the thing that book said he did so here it shows that sanctuary mass so sanctuary is that you know ai that absorbed all the trauma of the heroes and uh so i guess that's what direction we're gonna go we're gonna leave however the the heroes that it's showing here it, it's got roy it's got jessica uh cruz from the green lanterns Cyborg, Dove, Harley. You can't see the middle one because the mask is directly over there. And then Frankenstein. I'm assuming Babs because there's red hair with the bat ears sticking out. So it's not like a full cowl. Mm -hmm. And then maybe Miss Martian. I can't tell because the platform's over. So yeah, so I got to the end of it. I'm like, well, I guess this is my penance for keep going that I'm I'm going to put myself through this to see where this goes. Because I, I, I'm curious to see what Williamson's going to do and how how Rachel it's going to make me. Um, so, yeah. Uh, art here by Isaacs is pretty good. There's a lot of fun action moments. Um, you know, Ollie being strung up with Waller talking to him makes for a striking visual. Um, the Hall of Justice looks real good. That that person, that robot thing that, that Ollie fights looks pretty cool, despite not knowing exactly what it is. Um, but yeah, man, I got to Sanctuary, and I was like, I hope Pete doesn't get spoiled on this, because I, I can't wait to drop this bomb. I just, I don't think anyone wants to talk about it, Matt. I think that, so I'm we, not we don't, spoilers. Except, <laughs> clearly, except for the editors and Williamson. So, you know. Ah, dear. <sighs> Can't let it die. So, anyways, Green Arrow. I'm gonna keep reading. I've done this to myself. <laughs> you have done this. No one's yeah. thrust Who's this upon you. Put, put, put the sound. You know, put the bread on my side. Call me an idiot sandwich. But I, I gotta see now. The just the curiosity here. Other than that, it was an okay issue. I mean, we're really pulling from all, all elements of Green Arrow. I would say of the past, you know, 10, 15 years, bringing Diggle in. Who was only brought in because of the the TV show, right? We have Connor Hawk back. We have all this other, you know, him jumping through time and all that in the early part of this. Now to tie it back into, I'm assuming whatever events coming, right? Uh, that involves Waller and Mister Bones and Peacemaker and well, Peace Wrecker. What do you mean, whatever events coming? We have a name, Absolute Power. Right. Thank you for. I forgot <laughs> the name of it. So was like, um, this was just last week, Matt. <laughs> yes. Uh, but yeah. So. I, I can't recommend this despite giving it an okay score of like a seven. Um, unless you, unless you really like to, to, you know, 
you're really curious on what's going on with Williamson and, and the, the plot threads leading to absolute power. So, but yeah, this was a seven. Okay. All right. The Penguin, issue seven, Tom King rating with Stevan Subic. Subic. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, do my best. Yeah, close, uh, close enough. So yes, this is uh, following up with more of the the backstory stuff. This is Penguins now in charge of the Iceberg Lounge, and we're you know we're we're doing this sort of interlude flashback story still. I mean, we'll get back to Penguin with his team that he's assembled for the present day stuff later. Uh, but this is very much about how he had a working relationship with Batman in those early days. And how he had to try and basically circumvent the reputation because people kind of noticed that he was seemingly getting let away with stuff. Uh, so ultimately, he says to Batman that he has to like convince everyone else that we're not working together by mm-hmm. also taking him in and arresting him and putting him in Arkham. And he even that's kind of how he ends up with the look of the penguin and mm-hmm. you know the name. He, he says, "I have to be a colorful character. I have to be like Riddler or Catwoman or." whatever i have to be larger than life uh but much like all the other issues this again is told from the narration of other people who are in the scene with them and some of them are quite funny uh the first one which is this like you know gangster henchman that comes in and penguin wants the contact information for what turns out to be the help this is where he sort of first interacts Mm -hmm. with him he stabs this guy in the neck and i love that it's his narration because then his narration just sort of goes neck he no how I heart like it sort of like breaks okay. up after he gets stabbed and i thought that was quite funny in a dark way <laughs> so so for a hot second i forgot that was the gimmick of this book right because uh-huh. i read so many books i forgot and i was like i had to go back and read it. i'm like wait this is not the penguin that's getting stabbed why i'm like oh yeah the penguin is not narrated once so not once. <laughs> no. yes and then it made a lot more sense and it was darkly funny yeah uh so yeah and we get a little bit of garden uh working with batman uh the this murder of this henchman like the knife uh like batman gets the knife he's analyzing it for for anything and he finds fabric on it which eventually leads to someone else but it it, it comes to see penguin there's this whole song and dance where he knows penguin's lying and penguin knows that batman knows Mm -hmm. he's lying but he's not been able to prove anything that penguin did something but we obviously know he did just murder this guy by stabbing him in the neck so it's showing Mm -hmm. how how good he is at even playing Batman. Even when Batman knows that he's being played or suspects that he's being played, he can't quite figure out what Penguin's doing. So it makes Penguin feel like a formidable foe in that sense. In fact, by the end of the issue, one of Batman's lines in the narration is, um, you know, all these years later, I still wonder sometimes, was I playing him? Was I using him? Or mm-hmm. was he using me? And that's kind of the the core question that this issue gets up to. Uh, because he, you know, Penguin sort of like rambles on whenever Batman comes to see him, and uh, like Batman just lets him talk. The idea that he'll reveal things, not just stuff that Penguin's intentionally revealing, but he'll reveal other things by the stuff that he omits, by the way he says things, by the way he's nervous about certain things. Um, turns out that uh, he had his wife who's sleeping with uh, one of the Bartonellis <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, to have sex with this other guy still has like fancy like not one of a kind but close enough one of a kind handkerchiefs so that they could wipe the knife with it so that it would lead batman to this guy because he has the handkerchief that's left like fabric like fragments on the Mm -hmm. knife so we get this ridiculous scene where it's all from the wife's narration where she's talking about how awful this this guy is how his cologne stinks and then batman comes out of the scene and beats the shit out of him uh, right in front of her and just sort of casually says are you okay ma'am yeah, <laughs> and she... I love the art you alright ma'am <laughs> like I just I don't picture Batman ever talking like that um, so it's just it's very funny yeah there's, there's definitely a dark sense of humour through a lot of this This mm-hmm. not just this issue but just this book in general Like, mm-hmm. uh... well, even the fact when she's talking about you know he's disgusting and all this other the stuff that we would usually describe uh, penguin as right but she's attracted to his entire like almost like his competence that that oswald's very good at all of these little schemes right and yet yeah. it's it's the more traditional kind of suave gangster types that she's talking about like oh he's wearing too much cologne and 
you know, um, I'm trying to, th- what, a, what the other stuff, just this whole presentation. Well, I think um, a, a little trick he does in the writing here, King, is that he mentions, like, one of the things she says is that she can't wait to take a shower and wash yeah. the stink of this cologne off. The mm-hmm. next time we see her in the book is the scene where she's having a bath with Penguin. They're in, like, a hot mm-hmm. tub together. And yeah. it kind of feels like that's kind of symbolic, the idea that she she is cleaning with Penguin. Like, this, this mm-hmm. is, I don't know, like there was something there to me where, that connected those two scenes. Well, and she kind of helps him create the, the Penguin gimmick. Right, yeah, like yeah, yeah. she she points out all these things that he can lean into, like his obsession with birds, and he looks good, and you know he looks good when he dresses up. So you have to do something extra flamboyant, like a tuxedo, because he doesn't wear those. He wears nicer suits. Yeah, she specifically says you look like a penguin when you wear a tux. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. So and then it, it all clicks. So like the whole idea of the penguin as a character was, you know, her and him. And, and it also kind of, because they, they point out that if he does this, he needs to end up in Arkham Asylum, right? If if he just does it by normal, he's going to go to Blackgate. And that's not going to help, right? Yeah. He's got to go to Arkham so he can get out easier. He has to be seen as a colourful character, like one uh-huh. of the rogues gallery. And just back on this whole, like, she mentions wanting a shower in her narration, mm-hmm. and later on she's bathing with him. It also yep. suggests that this is the real her when she's with Penguin. Yep. Like, because it ties to, like, what she was actually thinking at the time. But mm-hmm. whereas Penguin's let into that private time, she's he's let into when she's cleaning. Mm-hmm. So whatever demented relationship, you know, these two have, uh, yeah. th- this is this is what it is. Um, and there's all sorts of stuff in between where Penguin, like, bashes, like, a, a, a henchman's face, mm-hmm. uh, the bartender's face into the bar. Uh Which, again, the art's pretty good here, uh, showing, like, like, Penguin's reflection in the in the mirror, and then smashing his face. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Penguin's face in this art style still feels a little bit weird at times because it's very wide. Uh, yeah, it's it's my main problem with this book is kind of the art is like it's very stylistic, right? But it's nothing like what we were getting before. So like getting all the proportions and stuff, it just it's a little weird. But again, it is artistic expression. I just it makes Penguin look so monstrous. It works, though. Right? Yeah, like, I think the art's really good in terms of almost everything else. It's just Penguin's mm-hmm. face at times takes a little bit getting used to. Um, yeah. Did you like that he's bow tie when he's wearing a tuxedo in the shape of the Bat logo? Yep, I thought that was very funny. A really subtle touch. Mm-hmm. Well, that's subtle, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so we get... And I loved it when you get to that page after Penguin's explained to Batman, hey... For them not to be suspicious of our arrangement, you have mm-hmm. to take me in. And he convinces Batman, and he's like, for, for, very well then. We get a full-page spread of the Penguin attacking Batman. You know, this show that they're putting on, this fight for the for the world to see. And mm-hmm. I do like that the art here is kind of different, and Penguin does look more like a cartoon character as he's lunging at Batman. He's like, yep. you know, he's not Oswald Cobblepot right here. He's the character, mm-hmm. the Penguin, mm-hmm. uh, for the purpose of... Like, he's of- wearing a monocle right like yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but he looks more demented it's like the mm-hmm. but the, the contrast to that though is in the next page when you see him sitting in the straight jacket and he's just back to mm-hmm. being like dead eyed like just staring straight mm-hmm. ahead it's, it really presents this picture that the penguin is this character he puts on in this interpretation it's a little bit different mm-hmm. to other versions of penguin obviously but this is definitely king trying to put his own stamp in the character mm-hmm. for sure uh so yeah uh but the big thing, though, is that the reason why he wanted the help. So there's a scene in the middle where he goes to the help, and it's actually the help that gives him the, the recommendation mm-hmm. that uh, he can kind of tell that, like, your reputation is hurt right now because it feels like you're safe when everyone else isn't. So he's he's actually the one that inspires the Penguin to, like, do this whole mm-hmm. thing with Batman where they have to make it look like they're enemies. Like, you know, well, not that they were pretending they were friends before, no. but... The idea that you know you ha- you have to also take me in sometimes you have to actually put yeah. me through what the other the villains heat's go through. On, you yeah. know, like they're they're putting it together that you know how come you never get pinched, you know? Yeah, uh, but this help stuff is actually he's been hired for a job and when he gets hired in the, the middle of the issue we don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. By the end of the issue, uh, the help's back. They're in the car. And he's basically describing how, and this is in his narration, about how this was a tough job, how it was much more work than he thought it would be. But Mm -hmm. basically what he did, what Penguin asked him to do, is trace who paid for the Iceberg Lounge. When it was taken away from 
Falcone, Falcone. Or whoever it was, yeah. Um, who paid for it and gave it to him, right? And obviously, this was, there was levels of, like, the skies here. I'm, but ultimately, the help has been able to track down who the person was that actually paid for it. And the final panel is just a note saying Bruce Wayne. So I don't know if they're getting to the idea that Penguin's actually known for a long time that Batman's Bruce Wayne, or if they're going to do something else with this next mm-hmm. issue. Uh, but you know, there must be at least one more part of this this flashback story before we get back to the the regular, uh, yeah. you know, stuff. Um I still think this is very good. I think the craft is mm-hmm. very strong. I think the narration gimmick is still super good and the way it sells who the penguin is is this mysterious figure who's not... Because th- I think the thing you do by having the penguin be someone who never narrates himself and it's always from someone else's perspective. We've talked a lot since issue one about what that does for the, the story. But mm-hmm. I think the thing that I'm really realizing here, especially now that the story is getting into this idea that he puts on a front uh, of this character who's not really who he is, is this idea that by only ever giving us him from other people's perspectives, we're playing into this idea of them not knowing for sure, like, who he is. Like, some of them might get him better than others. And yeah. this idea that what they think of him might not be the reality of who he actually is. And it's only because we're getting all these different perspectives that we're able to actually piece together who he might actually be. There's still some room, though, for, for some surprises, but yeah. uh, I think that's it- what that, that third-person narration is doing for the character it's given it that mystique of like is this really him in the moment or is this just the penguin like yeah it character? adds to, it adds to that presence of the penguin right it, yeah. it's his reputation precedes him and we see how different people react to him like like the the guy that he he stabs with the switchblade at the beginning you know just going in there because he's not expecting any of that stuff to happen right it's just like oh a cobblepot's calling me in what does he need? You know, there's no like, like there's a respect there, but there's nothing that would suggest like, oh, my life's in danger. But we're also seeing now throughout the story that that reputation is something he's constructed, mm-hmm. or, or at least now he's constructing it. He's realizing he wants to have a specific kind of reputation. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's interesting. And also, he obviously kills that guy at the start because he doesn't want anyone else to know about the help. He's like making right. sure that's like a, there's no ties yeah. to that character. Right. So. I, I do, like, I know it wouldn't be an, a Penguin issue without that, but I would like to see at some point King do the, like, a one issue of the help on this adventure, because the stuff that he describes, uh-huh. I would love to see, because I think out of out of all the creations that King's given us, the help's up there for me. Mm. Like, I loved him in Killing Time. Uh, or is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Killing Time. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I loved him in that book. He just is a character that stuck out to have him come back here. Uh, and then more of the, the, the St. Clair character too, is like when we saw that how nervous she makes the penguin, right? Like he wasn't acting like himself. And now we see the, you know, the beginning kind of, the, of that relationship because she knows who he really is. Right. Like, which I, I think probably in turn explains why he's so nervous mm-hmm. with her yeah uh and the, the the present day stuff because she's mm-hmm. one of the few people that maybe he has been vulnerable with and being yep. openly honest with so mm-hmm. that that's enhancing this story and that in turn is enhancing future stories so yeah that, that's all that's all very good stuff uh yep. but I, I think the biggest complaint i would have here is that as much as as good as this and last issue where this mm-hmm. like flashback story is it's not mm-hmm. as good as the is the yeah. ongoing main story. So it's a little bit lesser to that, but still very, mm-hmm. very good. It's just not yeah. quite as amazing as the other stuff. Yeah. It definitely is a penguin that I'm still not used to because, you know, again, we've, we've talked about in the last issue how the Cobblepots are this big family in, in Gotham and, you know, all this. But the fact that he's a self-made guy that came up by basically using Batman to clear out the, you know, the criminal contingent for him to consolidate power I'm almost preferring that to to the old wealthy aristocrat version. Sure. You know, it makes yeah. him that much more dangerous and it makes him a counter to Bruce who, you know, Bruce takes his family fortune and makes himself. Whereas Oswald took it himself and, and did everything. So it, it adds a, a whole layer to their relationship as well. And I love when, I love when the Bat villains can reflect on Bruce a little bit. Well, I, I think it makes sense that Penguin's not physically a threat to Batman, but the idea mm-hmm. that he may be outthinking him uh, mm-hmm. in ways that Batman is, is too arrogant to suspect most of the yeah. time, 
is quite interesting. But as, as, as I'm sure we'll find out, though, as the, as the story goes on at the present day stuff, and we see him interact with Batman a bit more. Because, uh, you know, we started off with that tease of them going down the Batwing right back at the start of issue one. Mm-hmm. I do wonder if we get a sense of, like, you know, at some point Batman did realise that Penguin's actually dangerous and killing people and has to be taken care of. Like, I wonder when that rela- that mm-hmm. working relationship maybe broke down. Right. Because I assume it did at some point, but... Right, and you have to uh, assume, too, that... Let's say he does put together that he knows that Bruce is Batman. That only has value to him because he's the only one that knows. Right? So if he puts it out there for everybody to figure out, it it, it does nothing. So it, that also adds a different aspect to their relationship, too. Oh. Yeah, I'm back. Don't so worry. There you go. Uh, <laughs> I was listening. Don't worry. I was just... Yeah, uh... you're good. You're good. Uh, but, you know, yeah, definitely adds a different layer on that, too, that even if he does know, if he pieces it together, like, how useful is that to, to him in manipulating Batman? Well, uh, maybe that's something we'll see next issue, is, like, mm-hmm. what he can do with this information. If he, even if, he, if he's pieced that together specifically, which he, I suspect mm-hmm. that he would, or at least he thinks there's a connection between them. Yep. Uh, but definitely an intre- it's, it's a good cliffhanger, I'll say that. Like, yeah. it, it was like, oh, okay, this is interesting. I, I also want to mention all the Bat villains in the last three years now that have learned about Bruce in <laughs> in Batman. Right? We got Joker currently in the Zdarsky stuff. Selina's known forever, which she's not really a villain. We have Penguin in in Detective Comics. We've had Harvey right in Two Face. Mm. You know, find out about him. I believe Riddler knows at some point too. You know, so we're we're naming all of these other ones. It, it just. It's almost like a, are you really a bat villain if you don't know that Bruce Wayne's Batman? You know? <laughs> like, Croc, are you in the big leagues? Is, you know, yeah, uh, you know, but yeah, it's just very funny. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's good. Uh, all right, what are you giving Penguin issue seven? Um, I'm going to give this, I'll give this an eight. Yeah, I agree. And I'll solid eight for me. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I realize that I'm rating everything in eight so far this week but mm-hmm. i kind of i kind of feel that like no, 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 nothing so far that we've talked about for me has been exceptional but they've all been really mm-hmm. good yeah uh for the most part so uh yeah i'm looking forward to getting back to the the ongoing present day stuff but uh i do think this mm-hmm. was a, an interesting issue so uh all right amazon's attack issue five mm-hmm. josie campbell writing with vasco zharjev on the Georgiev. Georgiev. There you go. Whatever. <laughs> on the art. So, um oh, I keep I keep forgetting to look up a dumb character's name. Who's the who's the woman from the Banner McDowell? Oh, Queen Faruka. Faruka. Right. Yes. <laughs> Every time I talk about this issue, I forget that woman's <laughs> name. Um so yeah, uh oh I'm in the wrong book. What, what, what am I doing here? You're in the uh, wrong part of the book, huh? No, I'm, I'm I'm looking at Jay Garrick. That's not what I oh. went looking at. <laughs> I, yeah, definitely. I, I went to page one. I'm like, why is Jay Garrick here? I'm, I'm, I'm here to talk about Amazon. Really weird, really weird shift in the story, huh? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, this issue. Obviously, we did the stuff last time where like Cassie became like mind controlled uh, through uh-huh. whatever, um, and it seems like uh, Yara or no Yara. Yeah, Yara is taken over this issue by it as well. Yep. So that's like a tease, but most of the issue, because most of the issue last time was those characters. This mm-hmm. issue, it's mostly Nubia and Faruka, uh, uh, who are currently being, you know, held captive by Peacemaker, who mm-hmm. is trying to define what peace is to him with a big smile on his face, which gave me a chuckle. Uh, but it, it is. I, I want to give Josie Campbell credit because I I still haven't finished Peacemaker, and this made me want to go back and finish the show. Um. I read this in John Cena's voice. So I, I want to give Campbell credit for that. That mm-hmm. it it's it seems very familiar to that to the James Gunn version of Peacemaker. And I think that only adds knowing on on you know what happens on, on that show, it it really makes him kind of a counterpoint to the Amazons, and he fits very well into you know this Amazon uh, versus the AXE story yeah uh i did get a lot confused early on here because all of a mm-hmm. sudden there was like a big spectral looking figure and mm-hmm. like hippolyta was there and i'm like what the hell's happening and mm-hmm. then it turned out oh this has all been sort of beamed into uh like nubia's head right yep. 
she, she's seeing visions of like a similar incident play out with Hippolyta. Um, and uh, what's his face mm-hmm. here? Uh, Hercules, right? Yeah, but it's spelled differently. It's like Her- Hercules. Well, Heracles. Yeah. Is that just like yeah, an old spelling of Hercules? Because so, uh, of Greek. Yeah. So just, just you know, uh, ancient Greek being what it was, Hercules is the anglicized version the, for okay. English. But more traditionally, it's Heracles. Okay, I'll just call him Hercules then. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, so he cause it shows up. Maybe we got like a fun thing here where uh, they, they break out the baby carrots. The axe agent uh, is like, hey, mm-hmm. we found these carrots. And uh, Hoppy gets a hold of them, which gives them fuel to teleport. So they start mm-hmm. teleporting all over the place and fighting Peacemaker. Uh, yeah. We end, we we go to uh, what, uh, Philadelphia first, then we end up mm-hmm. in Mumbai, and then we're in Edinburgh, bizarrely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're just fighting through teleporting holes. They end up in Santa Fe. Uh, so yeah, it's a fun little sequence. Big capper to this though is that as they're fighting Peacemaker, Nubia. Uh, goes to hit Peacemaker and there's a gunshot and this is actually a really dark bit in the issue it takes a very very big swing here where a child in Santa Fe like a young boy has picked up a gun that's dropped from Peacemaker one of the axe soldiers and shot Nubia in the side and it's like a really big kind of moment they're like you know Mm -hmm. drawing a kid with a gun in his hand is kind of ballsy Uh, so they break they go through a portal they end up in uh, I think Tunisia in a desert and Mm -hmm. like Farouk is patching her up, but I think what was interesting here is like to sort of like tackle that horrific incident, which is quite a, it's a big deal anyway. But what Nubia yeah. really like sort of latches onto here, which really like makes her feel something, is that that little boy that shot her like pushed his sister behind him and picked up the gun, thinking that he had to protect her from Nubia from an Amazon. Yep. And this very issue started with a page of like all these news reports and like podcasts talking about um like how the amazons are threats mm-hmm. i loved how the one was a podcast where the other guys like and also we'll tell you how to bury your gold in the backyard yep. got to bury your gold grifter's gonna grift <laughs> uh so that gave me a chuckle but i was like you know what this, this is landing hard this idea because nubia starts talking about her origin and how like mm-hmm. you know sh- when she came out of the was it the the well or whatever yeah. um she Basically, you know, like, smelled earth and she was like, this is magical. She was raised, or not raised, but she was, you know, she she learned to love Themyscira, but when she went into the man's world, as they called it, she basically quickly realized that a lot of that was beautiful too. And she didn't, she basically, she really hated using the term man's world because really this is our world and this is all part of our world and we should, like, fight to make all of it better. Which I think is interesting because obviously that's something that Wonder Woman also does, even if she doesn't say it that way. But I do like the idea of like this, you know, the, the the queen of the Amazons being having that attitude and being like, no, no, mm-hmm. we can't just be this segregated little community that's away from everyone else. We kind of have to make it better for everyone, for all the, the all the the innocent people, the children, all everything, all over the world. And she's she admits that she's kind of doubting if like she still believes all of this. Yeah. But you know, like obviously this this moment with this kid shooting her to protect the sister. Is, mm-hmm. is hit hard. So I, I liked all this stuff. I, I thought it was a really good dramatic and, uh, character bit. And that plays off of what Farouk is telling her as she's heating up, you know, her sword to, you know, because she digs the bullet out to, you know, to, to what's that called? Uh, cauterize. Yeah, cauterize. The bleeding. The yeah. Right. And so she talks about, you know, the Bonham McDowell is that, you know, they've been a scar, right? Is that everything about them because they open, you know, the Bonham McDowell is the one rare uh, Amazon tribe that accepts, you know, new people into it, right? So you have these women that that end up searching for them and joining their ranks, but it's she, they all she, have one thing in common. Yeah, she makes it sound like they're, it's almost like a support group for people who have, are mm-hmm. victims of abuse or have been, you know, right. like, basically chewed up by the world. And they, they, they right. need the Bonham McDowell, they need an Amazon group to, like, give them refuge from the rest of the right. world and that's because the world hurt them and that they you know we're we're like the scar we're the proof of you can heal and get better and so the fact that we get into nubia stuff is like well no this world also has beauty and we can be there and and join in on it too we just have to set the example i thought that was a really good example of what wonder woman stands for you know and so the fact that it's nubia as the queen of the amazons 
you know, that these are two competing ideals for the Amazons right now, even going back to the Tom King book. I, I think first things first, that, that speech from Faruka about the Baron McDowell mm -hmm. made them more interesting to me instantly. Because yeah. I didn't know that about them, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that they just accept people who need something like that. Yep. I'm like, okay, that, that makes you instantly stand out against the other Amazon mm -hmm. tribes, and I understand you better, and now you have a place like in my head for what you are. Mm -hmm. That's great. But also yep. this idea from Nubia that, no, we can't just shut ourselves off from the rest of the world. Like, making an island where you're just protected from all mm -hmm. the bad things doesn't solve any of the problems and eventually yeah. they still might come knocking anyway like you have to like mm -hmm. try and change the world so there's a, there's a lot in it like this is kind of a lighter book all things considered compared to the regular yeah. wonder woman book but i feel like this issue has actually raised some really big themes that feels it, like it's playing really nicely to me well, and yeah and it feels it feels like it's playing off of the the main wonder woman run too in just a yeah. slight way of what it means to be an amazon and, you know, when, when there's all this propaganda out there, it's like, well, do we become the propaganda or do we fight back against it? Because they even bring up the Escasita where they're a secret, they're a shadow, but they're also in man's world. You know, they're this kind of wild card in everything that, you know, while in man's world, they're apart from it. Um, and that secrecy has led them to, you know, still being around. Um and so I just like all these different play, and it made me like Nubia, and not that I disliked her, but this, you know, this whole thing when she says, you know, she gets to the end of her story about man's world is our world, the world that belongs to all of us together, and she's smiling despite this pain. And I was like, man, Nubia is a great character. I was feeling that as well. I felt like more connected to Nubia as a character in this issue than I ever have. Now, admittedly, mm -hmm. it doesn't help that all that Wonder Woman stuff that was being written like last year. Yeah was stuff that I didn't I didn't like the writing, so I just didn't read yeah. any of it. And there was a lot of right. Nubia, there was like a Nubia mini series involved in all mm -hmm. that and stuff. But I felt like this issue sold me both on Nubia as a character and what she believes mm -hmm. in and what makes her interesting and what makes her different from Hippolyta, but also sold me on the Banna McDowell as a concept yep. and Faruka as a character. So I feel like this issue, like in a one two punch, made me care more about these two characters that I, I yep. am not really just had enough of or or had enough meaningful stories with to really care mm -hmm. about so i on that this issue was a victory because last issue i was saying hey it's great that this issue focuses on mary and yara because yeah. i like those characters and you know I, I, obviously i do mm -hmm. but this issue did the harder thing it took the other ones that i don't know as well and made me care more about them uh but also gave me some fun stuff with peacemaker and hoppy and the portals and all that yeah. stuff but then hit you with all this gut punch stuff towards the end yeah. uh, the the final of the issue is that then Faruka becomes possessed and knocks out Nubia and she wakes up tied up next to Mary. Uh, Mary notably is not an Amazon, so seemingly she's safe, because that seems yep. to only be a possession that works on... Oh. Like, true Amazons. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we've seen anyone else possessed uh, throughout the run. I could be wrong, though. Maybe back in issue one or two. Uh, yeah. But yeah, she's like, hey, you found Asylum, and it's like Faruka who's possessed and all the other Amazons who are possessed, but like, because uh, I think that's Yara over to the right, who seems to have yeah. like, been frozen to stone. Yeah, which makes me wonder about the Gorgons and Medusa. Yeah. And if you know anything about their history is they were victimized by, by men. And that's why they, you know, became these creatures. And, you know, um, and again, in Birds of Prey, we just dealt with, uh, what was her name? That was the the mother of the Gorgons. Oh, uh, oh, oh, oh! I can't remember the name. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, yes, yeah. you're right. You're right. <laughs> right, and so it's just fun how all of these Amazonian things are either editorials editorials killing it, or we're just at this space where it's concurrent storytelling, right? That just happens to piece fit together. I, I mean. But, Obviously, like the the dynamic of what Wonder Woman is going through right now is set by mm -hmm. the main book, which is King doing right. that. But it feels like Josie Campbell's fit this story around what's going on there really yeah. well. That fits yeah. in thematically, but it's doing great stuff for its own characters. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I, I can't you know because I think issue three was the one that was a little wonkier, where it felt like it yeah. was a little bit unfocused. But I think these this issue is probably the best issue of the book so far. Uh, it's the mm -hmm. penultimate issue. Next one's the last issue. Uh, but obviously Campbell's moving over to Shazam after this, so we'll see more of Mary written by her at yeah. the very least. Well, but... and the fact that we're playing with mythological concepts in Shazam and Campbell's done so well here with these mythological... Yeah. You know, it makes me very excited to see other 
you know, because, you know, Shazam's kind of, yes, we have all of the names, but it's also always been whatever mythology they choose to play with. Um, so that makes it very exciting. I'm looking for the mother of the Gorgons now because it's driving me nuts. Uh, uh, just, just look at last issue of Birds of Prey, I guess. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> it'll be well, it wasn't somewhere. the mother, but it was almost the god of them. Oh, my God. Anyways. Um, but yeah, it's it's where this kind of lost me and not like lost me in, in interest, but I got a little confused was when, when Nubia is like, um, the only thing I'm certain is which Amazon betrayed us. And then Faruka attacks her and she says, so am I. So, so what does that meant to mean? Like is... Because it feels like Nubia's put together the possession angle, right? Mm -hmm. Like, th yeah. So I'm just I'm confused on how that comes out here. You know, is like when did when did Nubia put this together? Was it with Peacemaker? You know, was it right I, I, before? I think it was when she was getting the visions. You know, okay. earlier on in the issue that makes the most sense to me. I think something about that okay. has told her something. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, really good stuff. Uh, I think this has been a another example of why Josie Campbell hanging out is always having a DC book is probably a good thing now. Yeah. So, uh, very, very good. By the uh, way, it was Magira. Magira. I knew it was an M. Magira, yep. I knew it was an M, but I, c I couldn't for life even remember yeah. it. This is, this is one of these things, we're talking about this year on the Flashbook, about all these like random new names mm -hmm. that they, they put into things. No, no, that, that may not be a new thing, admittedly. That may be a pull from an old thing, but... Mm -hmm. uh, Remember all these names and concepts when you're reading like a, a line of comic books over many years? Yeah. It gets very, very difficult. <laughs> it is. It is It is very tall, uh, very tough. So, uh, All right, what are you rating Amazon's Attack Issue 5? Uh, I'm going to give this uh, an 8.5. I had a lot, of, a lot of good stuff in this one. Yeah, I'm still just going to go with a straight 8. I'm being boring this week and just yeah. give it everything an 8. But uh, I think it's really solid. I think the art is, is pleasant and expressive i think that moment with the kids shooting there lands well because mm -hmm. it's been such a, a fun book up until that point and it feels like and like you say the smile on nubia's face as she's sort of like saying what her ideology is mm -hmm. all of that stuff is really good uh so yeah there we go jay garrick the flash issue five jeremy adams writing with diego or oral tige on the art so uh dr elemental is that his name? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dr. Elemental. Yeah. Okay. Just again, all these names. Uh, Judy and Jay are trying to figure out, obviously, I mean, we left in a cliffhanger where like the, the, the woman at the, the place started yeah. shooting them with their robot arm. So we get a bit of an action scene where they're dealing with that mm -hmm. first, uh, which, you know, is fun enough. Jay's like moving really fast to avoid getting hit and he, he vibrates her arm, which makes her malfunction. So she's glitching <laughs> out. But then Dr. I Elemental's like talking through her. Mm -hmm. and taunting them so you know, did you like her head being like snapped back over her head well, that was great i like though that he's vibrating and the arm comes off and he jay didn't seem to mean to do that right <laughs> so that added a bit because um we didn't know if she was an actual robot quite yet or if it was like a cyborg lady so that that came as a surprise so yeah then when it ends up being a robot and her head snaps around and there's a timer I thought again. This is this is all very pulpy, silly, yeah. kind of golden agey stuff. She self she self detonates, and like we just yep. get this full page spread of like, the top of the building going boom. Uh, but of course, there's like lines of lightning to suggest that the flashes of of ran mm -hmm. out. You know, so uh, fun stuff. But they uh, they have to go. Uh, obviously, they've evacuated the building as well. They've saved all the scientists and whatnot, yep. which is nice. Um, but we have to go find Elemental. So they go to Brazil. Uh, to meet uh, Dr. Midnight. Uh, I mean, they don't do the reveal that he's Dr. Midnight till later, but if you know who Peter oh, is God. with the eye, you, you know who it is. Yeah, I knew that. I'm like, wait, why is Dr. Midnight in Brazil? <laughs> so before I was like, maybe this is just a guy, maybe he shares a name, I don't know. And then when we get to the, the Midnight Cave and there's a gigantic owl, and I was like, oh, it's Dr. Midnight, right? But I'm like, why is he living in Brazil in the City of the Sun? I don't know. Just go with uh, it. I mean, I don't think it matters. I think the idea is that obviously the current JSA doesn't have mm -hmm. him in it, so he's just off doing his own thing. Yeah. Uh, but it makes sense that Jay knows him, right? Actually, there's mm -hmm. a, something I really liked in the art here is yeah. the page where he takes them into his like, hut, but there's a secret, obviously, elevator down to his cave. Yeah. Um, I like that the art actually kind of built 
the panels around that elevator so you can sort of mm-hmm. see them at the top and then like where they land at the bottom i just thought it was a simple little touch that kind of showed you how they like went down and i don't yeah. know it, it worked for me uh but you know basically jay's asking for his help uh but he's like hey i think they've followed you here and yeah it seems that uh, army of robots and Ro- robear or have come to try and get Judy. So they suit up. Jay tells yep. Judy to stay back in the cave because because she's what they specifically want. She should stay away from the fighting. She's not happy about it, but fair enough. She'll stay back. Uh, so I, I enjoyed her being a little kind of like, you know, antsy and like sort of mm-hmm. scrunching her face up in the art. Uh, but Elemental predicted all this. He just kind of like appears in the cave. He, he literally makes the cave, like the the wall of the cave, open like the Red Sea at one point with yeah. his powers. It's a whole thing. Uh, but yeah, the, the shooter with a dart knocks her out, so Elemental gets her. Uh, and that's basically the main thing of the issue is that Judy has been kidnapped. There's a lot more action, of course, uh, with yeah. Jay and Midnight fighting this army. Uh, but the main thing with that is that once Jay realizes she's gone, they come back. He try he starts questioning Robear. And then Midnight's like, hey, by the way, that teleporter device that's in your like body, I took that out when we were fighting, so you can't go back anywhere. Uh, so it seems like we're going to be interrogating Robear next issue. So. I love, again, the art here with the expressions where, where he goes, wait, why, why can't I transport? Why isn't it working? Just the, the smile to the look of concern over, you know, the two panels. Very, very good art. Yeah, you'd almost feel bad for him. He looks so concerned in that last page. Yeah. But he's also oh, I mean, an, he's an evil bear, though. So He's an evil bear, but is he evil because he was tinkered with? Was he evil before? These, these are all questions that I have. Yeah. Dr. Know. Elemental, by the way, now we're seeing more of him walking around in his costume. Yeah. He's, got, he's got a very uh, Dr. Doom kind of look to yeah. him. Dr. Doom, even down to the, like... The, the gauntlets, right? Mm-hmm. And, and like the hooded with the mask. So like that can't be an accident. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm tr- what, like, what is his plan with Judy? That that's where I'm at, that I haven't quite pieced together, you know, um, because he's always been interested in, in her almost as a conduit. So yeah, I, I don't think you're meant to have been able to piece it together completely anyway. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't worry too mm-hmm. much about that. Yeah. Also, how great is that splash, uh, splash phase, Doctor Midnight and Jay, where Jay's you know pummeling Robear. Uh, oh yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, looks he, great. He's punching in super speed, so you've got all these speed lines mm-hmm. as if it's his arms that have been going up and down as Doctor mm-hmm. Midnight's just kicking a robot's head off. Yeah, <laughs> it's good stuff. Oh, and I'll just noticed in the foreground has a. Uh, his moon boomerang thing, yeah. stabbing a robot's head in the foreground. It's also a yeah. nice touch. Nah, no, nah, it's a fun book. It's a it's a fun, mm-hmm. lighthearted book. It's always a quick read. I never really have any big complaints, but at the same time, I wouldn't praise it that high either. It's, it's just a really solid, fun little mm-hmm. time. It's nice to spend time with these characters. Uh, so, what are you giving Jay Garrick the Flash? Um, I'm gonna do this uh, an eight. Yeah, I'll go with a seven for this one. I think this is definitely uh, maybe a tier down from the other books I read, but still a fun time. No, no uh, regrets certainly. Mm-hmm. Power Girl issue six: Leah Williams and Margaret Savage on the art. This is another mm-hmm. Matt book because uh, he's a sucker for uh, big boobs. Take it away, Matt. It's not just that she she's a muscle mommy. All right, <laughs> it's not like, just that. I love how you didn't yeah. try to deny it. You just said it's no, not just that. <laughs> it's not just that. Um. No, it's I got Leah Williams. I have to give credit. Whatever has been going on with this book, the amount of character work that they have done with Paige, you know, giving her her own identity, and in this book, teaming her with Kara, um, I just I, I just hope that this is a thing that lasts because one of the reasons I've never been able to connect with Power Girl was we never got like kind of this definitive, you know, what makes her special. Um, and here making her, uh, you know, a different Earth version of Supergirl and how she fits in with the Super family has really worked. Um, but this issue kicks off uh, with Savage um, drawing like so it's the typical Savage art until it shifts to the second place they go to where it becomes it looks more like traditional like storybook art. So I got to give them credit because I know that like. Savage so starts off for everybody. I believe you've, you've called them, you know, blow up doll eyes, right? There's kind of a <laughs> lifelessness 
I don't um, know if I used that specific sentence, but yeah, I remember complaining. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think you did, because I, I don't know where I would have got it. But yeah, so halfway through this page, or not halfway, we get near the bottom, but it's a bunch of these uh, college girls that looks like they're, or teenage girls, are at the Kilgore Academy for, for the Gifted, and they're, you know, messing around. One of the girls is trying to, to you know, finish home homework or in, like, a library. But they... They look to this one girl with dark hair, and they're like, oh, do you want to try Avalon with us? And she holds out, like, these pills. Uh, and and our, our main girl is like, well, I guess. And as soon as she takes it, she ends up getting, like, sucked through this portal into the storybook land where it it looks like a like a, a traditional fairy tale village with this gigantic castle in the background on this mountain. Almost like she got pulled into a Disney movie. This sounds fact, like my worst nightmare. <laughs> yeah, for I, sure. I think I would hate this issue. You you would think that until, you know, there's maybe art wise, yes. But so what this ends up being is is Paige and Kara teaming up to track down where this, these drugs are coming from. Um, because uh, Kara had had traced uh, Streaky. Right, that they were testing out this drug on Streaky uh, from that last issue, which was following him through his adventure, and that you know Kara's like, well, we need to get the stuff off the street. We don't know what it can do. People have gone missing, which is what Kara gets uh, on there, which is why she's on the trail. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, well, we can go undercover. Um, and they go, I I guess. And so they end up going metro- to Metropolis University. Um, just as college students. And basically for that, it's it's just Paige, you know, wearing a tank top in, in boots and a short skirt, which she ends up running into her intern from, you know, the first, like, two issues, who's confused as why she's dressed like that. Because, you know, she knows, like, she's this, she runs uh, her, her startup, and she also writes for the Daily Planet, and she passes it off like they're doing a story, for Lois, but you can't tell anybody because I have to be, you know, undercover. And so the the intern's like, oh, yeah, okay, then, you know, that works. And as they keep going, they end up running into um, Omen, who's also there, uh, and they're trying to, to find out where these kids are getting the, the drugs from. Uh, Omen ended up using her telepathic powers, and they, they find out that there's these two henchmen wearing the comedy and tragedy masks that are going around offering these drugs to people. Um, and they're, they're doing drops. They find out that uh, the next drop will be under a bridge by the river. So the, you know, our super girls go off. They end up getting uh, some of them from, from that bus that they did with Omen. And when they, they get into the pill, it ends up, it's almost like a, like a, a, gelatin ball and when they cut it open this like tendril comes out and uh uh kara calls it a biomass and they're like okay well we can't we can't take this stuff we don't know what it will do to our kryptonian physiology um so we'll just you know we'll try to keep it contained uh they they go and they go to one of the bridges um kara's dressed in a cloak um and they end up preventing these guys from selling their wares. Uh, they try to get away. Paige knocks one of them into the water. Uh, and as she's going after the next one, she sees that he's spray painting this like weird like letter onto a side of a building. And then he touches it and goes through. Um, Kara comes from out of the water where she followed the other one in. He's gone as well. And she's upset, and you know this is where Savage's art looks really good because uh, she comes out of the water, and there's like these splash lines all over, and her eyes are doing the Kryptonian glow thing, except it looks more like electricity. Uh, so it gives her this very um, imposing sense. All the color is like pinks and blues, and everything can con- contrast really well. Um, and it goes. Uh, they they realize that like. When these people disappear when they take the drug, what if, what if this is like a teleportation thing, and they're going somewhere else? 
And then it cuts to over that this this name that they've gotten from some of the people that have used it uh, is called uh, Ferimbia. And Paige hypothesized, like, what if it's an alternate dimension to where Leah Williams in a caption goes, Ferimbia, uh, an alternate dimension. And it's that castle from the first couple pages. And there's a lady who looks like Emerald Empress, you know, the Legion villain. Um, she's in all green. She's uh, clearly magical because she's looking into a cauldron. Uh, and, and basically saying, like, we're, we're taking all of these kids from Metropolis for a reason. In that they're bringing them to Ferimbia and she needs more of them for, for whatever it's going to need. So our, our Supergirls end up realizing, like, when that guy painted that that uh, symbol, um, it created a doorway. So um, they end up redoing it and taking some of that biomass stuff and rubbing it on uh, to the wall. And it ends up taking them to Ferimbia. But before they went, they, they argue. They're like, well, we have no idea how to get back. And Paige is like, well, I'll just astral punch. It's, you know, what use is going to an alternate dimension if I can't astral punch my way out? So when they get there, they're very confused by the storybook stuff. Um, and the girl that was from the start pops out of a bush to them and is like, oh, great. You're never leaving. Uh, they Paige tries to punch out and nothing. Um, they can't fly. They don't have any powers and they're stuck here. And, and our girl from the, the beginning is like, no one that goes to the castle ever comes out. Um and it, it cuts back to the, the witch in green who realizes that our two heroines are Kryptonian um, and says, you know, that, you know, their powers have been neutralized. Nothing will stop me now with an evil laugh with all of these college students. You know, it looks like they're building a rock wall um, around the castle. And, and that's where we leave off. So a very fun issue, despite, you know, the inherent silliness of it all. I, I love the the back and forth between Kara and Paige. It really makes them feel, you know, uh, it gives Paige a spot in the super family. Um, the, the fact that she has this kind of contentious relationship with, with Kara, but they still respect each other. You know, I, I, I'm glad to see that coming out here um, because, you know, Kara being the more experienced super of the two, right? Like, uh, what it means to be part of the Superman family and Paige still trying to prove herself. It gives her this headstrong as this, where she looks before she leaps. So Kara being that character to kind of draw her back in to being like, look, you know, you, you got to think about these things. Uh, I, I really enjoy that. Um, so, so yeah, uh, Leah Williams is just continually to, to add layers to, to power girl. Uh, and then the art here, the way that it, it jumps back, between the storybook style art and Savage's typical art and the, the color use, which I'm always a fan of Savage, even if you don't enjoy the dead eyes, uh, at least the colors are pretty. Here, that kind of pastel -y continues, that pastel, you know, the greens, blues, pinks, everything playing off of each other. Um, Yeah, so I'm going to give this an 8.5. All right. Uh, that was the last pick. So that is out the part of the show where we pick our favorite stuff of the week for it panel slash moment. Favorite cover, favorite uh, artist, top five books, all that stuff. And that mm -hmm. noise, you sometimes hear it as, I think, wind hitting off Matt's window. It, it's wind and the garbage man right now. So oh, okay. uh, it's an O for, o for two. Uh, my, my neighborhood hates me. All right, Matt, what was your panel slash moment of the week? Am I crazy to make it the, the sanctuary reveal? <laughs> Is the moment of the week have to be something positive? Can I it mean, be something that made me throw my iPad? I mean, if you want to go with that, you, you, you're... I mean, it, it's not going to be, um, mine's actually going to be from Amazon attack and it's going to be that, that shot of Nubia smiling when she goes, it, it should be our world. Uh, I, that really resonated with me. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff to pull from this week, but that one in particular, when we got talking about it, the fact that you noticed it too, and it gave mm -hmm. you the same feeling, uh, really drove home that for me. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why you picked this week. It's a uh, a lot of similar feelings, uh, levels wise across the books. Um, I ba Batman and Penguin looking to Saint Clair and calling her ma'am. That was up there too. Oh, that was sure. pretty funny. Yeah, 
Uh, I mean, I'm almost, I, I'm also tempted to to take something from Amazon's attack just because it does such an impressive job of making me mm -hmm. uh, care about a couple of characters that up until now I haven't that much. Uh, but I also really like the moment in Flash where Linda puts her hand on Molly's shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, I'll go with Amazon's attack. I think that was maybe more of a standout moment this week, so I'll go mm -hmm. with that. Uh, okay. So, cool. Uh, cover of the week, uh, there's a few options that I'll, I'll highlight. There's a Matina cover for Penguin, which obviously is mm -hmm. up to that usual standards. There's a Frank Avila cover for Detective, which is, is very nice, of Batman sort of on his knees in the desert. Kind of like a Furiosa and uh, Mad Max yeah. Fury Road, actually. Uh, but I got to go with another Detective variant, and it's the Federici variant of Batman on a horse with the, the scarf over his face. Uh, it's just really nice. Plus, the horse is like a skeleton, kind of like like an undead horse. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, the whole the whole thing's just very very pretty. Uh, so yeah. What's your cover of the week? Yeah. So I want to spotlight a couple of them. Um, the uh, Jay Garrick, the Flash, has a Manipul cover that has the Flash family on it. Uh, and I just I always love when Manipul does the Flash. Um, so that one's really good. There is a um. A detective one that you didn't mention, I think. I'm just like, my computer's being a bit. Um, no, it was the Frank Avila. I got them. I got them confused. Uh, but that one was nice as well. Uh, that was up there. But for me, uh, and it's just funny how you kind of called me out for for Power Girl because <laughs> it's, it's it's gonna be from Power Girl. But it's the Jen Bartel variant. Mm. It's just basically it's got Paige on there in her new costume, and I just love Bartel's art style. You know the the broad lines, um, like they're very thick and uh, I I just I'm trying to think it's it's not quite pulpy but it gives it that kind of vibe. Uh, but there's another one that if I wanted to be a you know a self parody, there's another Power Girl cover that's uh, from Dan Panosian, and it's got her flexing on the cover, you know. So but I believe I picked that one last month too. Um, of her flexing, so I'm just I'm gonna do my best not to get bonked. <laughs> All right, what was your art of the week? <sighs> Man, the Green Arrow Isaac stuff was really good. That was kind of the the highlight, but it'd be hard not to give it to Detective for Federici and uh, Raffaelli. So yeah, I'll, I'll go with Tech. Yeah. Um... You know, I like Dia Dot Jr. on Flash. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, bo both, I mean, honestly, both uh, Amazon's Attack and Penguin have really solid art. Yeah. Uh, but I also got to go with Detective. It's just, it's too much of a, a one-two punch yeah. uh, overall. So, all right, Matt, rank your top five books of the week. Okay. So I'm going to go uh, number one, Flash. Number two, Tech. Three, Power Girl. Four, Jay Garrick, Flash. In five penguin, no five Amazon attack. Okay, I think I did that right. Yeah, what's number one? Number one was the Flash. Yeah, I thought, I thought you heard you say that. Yeah, <laughs> you did. Interesting, interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't. Oh, this is that's a weird week. Uh, it's tough because they were all log jammed, and that's yeah. why like penguins and Amazon attack were neck and neck. But I think I liked Amazon's a little bit more. Yeah, I think I'm. <laughs> I think I'm going to go number one, Penguin. Number two, Amazon's Attack. Number three, Detective. Number four, Flash. And then number five, Jay Garrick, Flash. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, really weird week to rank, actually, because I had a lot yeah. of similar numbers for my ratings. Uh, all right, but that'll tell me, or that'll lead me to tell you what's coming next week from DC Comics. We have... Wait, is that right? That can't be right. But <laughs> I've skipped. I've, have I skipped a week? I did skip a week. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So next week we have Batman 145. We have Poison Ivy 20. We have Birds of Prey issue 7, start of the New York. Looking forward to that. We have Shazam issue 9, Blue Beetle 7. We have The Batman First Night issue 1. That's the Black Label book uh, mm -hmm. with sort of the Golden Age Batman. Really curious to check that out. Uh, Neil Before Zod issue 3, Suicide Squad Kill the Arkham Asylum. Uh, issue two. There's no the there. I added that because mm -hmm. the video game has a the Justice League, uh, and then Superman seventy eight is out next week as well as Batman Scooby Doo. So that is uh what's coming out. 
next week from DC Comics. So, uh, week one's been a quieter week for a little while, no difference next week, uh, but we do have a new Black Label book to check out. So, hey, if there's ever a week to give me a double-sized Black Label book, next week's perfect. So <laughs> Yeah, right? Um, I, I hate on the cover of Batman that he looks like Hush. I really... <laughs> Oh, so. uh, dear. But that... hey, we have Shazam and Birds next week. So we do. I'm we do. I'm looking forward very to those happy that. very much. So uh, that is the show, everyone. Thank you for joining us. You can, of course, hit the like button if you're on YouTube. It helps us a bunch and uh, give us a nice five star review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from. That all helps. Of course, you can support us more directly financially over at patreon.com slash TV and help keep the lights on and the comic books. Uh, being read and whatnot you can do that over there but uh that is the show so thank you very much for joining we appreciate it keep reading dc comics and remember to never get lost in the speech force